Anderson. <clears throat> Your Honor, about 450 and 455 respective ever since two emails from the state last night. And in these emails, there was a, uh, what was characterized as a life video of Sergeant Baker. There's no objection. If I could tender these as exhibits. Well, you're wanting to make this an exhibit? Yes, Your Honor. Or if this is exhibit one to this trial? I don't believe these videos or this particular video, excuse me, is contained in the stuff. Um, but in either case, I got noticed last night that I intend to play this video. Uh, I assume under TCA 4038103, subsection C allows for a photograph to be shown to the jury of the victim's condition, their lives in this photograph, and things like that. I assume that's the purpose of this video. Your Honor, I have to object to this particular video. It has Sergeant Baker's infant daughter crawling to him. I mean, it's focused on the baby more so than Sergeant Baker. Um, I know the statute allows a single photograph. It doesn't contemplate video. Here in Board I didn't have the benefit of this information that there was going to be this intention to play this video. That qualified jurors, I don't know if court was going to play. I don't know if the court's going to allow it. I'm not trying to have a but I'm saying I may have that we could have decided ahead of time. We could have addressed that during Board I perhaps. Um, I'm hopeful that we want the jury to decide this on the facts using logic. A video like this is just designed to inflame emotions and it would be highly prejudicial to my client. I respectfully assert and I would request the court keep it out. Yes. Judge may have made a state response. Thank you. Uh, it is correct that this video clip, it's a clip of a video, was sent to uh, Mr. Finley last night. The, uh, it was not included in the uh, typical discovery response, which we upload everything as court notice to the ProDocs. This, this video uh, serves two purposes. One, it's a live photo, but, but more importantly, this video clip, which we can pull up if you will, Mr. Uh, shows the positioning of Sergeant Baker's weapon and ass as he carries it on his duty belt. The reason that's important is this is the only video we have uh, of Sergeant Baker in a leaning position, which is similar to how his body is found in the patrol vehicle. And what's even more important to that and the relevance of this is that this ass, which is again behind his uh, duty weapon, is secured in position and it doesn't fall out when he leans forward as you will see here. Now, going to his death, his body is recovered crammed in the patrol vehicle, but the ass is actually wedged underneath his arm. And you can see in photographs of the trial, the asp is sticking out from underneath his arm, which we're gonna argue is the asp has been manipulated by the defendants in this case. It was actually removed and, and used in some way. Uh, this video demonstrates that an asp wouldn't just fall off of its duty belt by him leaning forward. And this is a copy of the video. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Pause it right there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Your Honor, if the court would notice, uh, Sergeant Baker was leaning forward on the ground in a duty belt and asked, and the ass did not fall out. Further, Your Honor, relevance to this is to show uh, the proof that <clears throat> Sergeant Baker's duty weapon was actually stolen and recovered from underneath the hood of the vehicle. So both items shown in this video were manipulated during the crime. <clears throat> Normally, as uh, Mr. Finley has pointed out, the uh, law now allows for a photograph, a life photograph of an individual in a murder case to be demonstrated to the jury so that they can have an idea of what the individual was like uh, during their life. Um, that is part of the state law now. 
in this particular situation, it constitutes a video, and, and if it were solely for the purposes of introducing it as a live video, then the court would sustain Mr. Finley's objection to it and exclude it. But with the state's argument that it has merit, merit on an evidentiary basis and that it goes to um, issues that are going to be raised, when do you intend to play this video, General? Judge, it'll be with our first witness. Then under those circumstances, what I propose to do is to allow it to be played, but give a limiting instruction to the jury that it's being allowed, uh, being introduced for evidentiary purposes regarding the uh, equipment that uh, Sergeant Baker was wearing at the time and, and uh, for that purpose only. Yeah, that could be accomplished with a screenshot. Pardon? That could be accomplished with a screenshot. Understand, but the uh, idea that the state is putting forward is that he's leaning forward and that the what uh, the ask or whatever we call it does not come forward. Is there a way to uh, limit it to show that uh, to instead of having the longer version of the child crawling to just li limit it to where uh, it shows Sergeant Baker leaning over at, at that point? Yes, sir, we, we can do that. And judge, uh, I can also, <clears throat> uh, what we can do is uh, crop the, a still photo uh, to show him in the leaning direction. Well, if we can do that, that would actually be the, the best scenario. And I think that the, the problem is engendering the sympathy of the jury for the, the minor child in the situation. It's a heart rendering scene, but uh, trying to limit that um, impact on the jury to the evidentiary value that it has and balancing the relevance versus the prejudicial effect. It would seem to me that that would require us to limit what we're showing as far as the child is involved. And if you can do that with a crop photograph then that would be my rule. Yeah. And, and just so the defense will be aware, we will do that. We'll crop that and, and render a, a copy of that to uh, the defense. And I'll probably introduce it through a separate witness uh, so we don't have to slow down. The That's fine. I mean, I, Mr. Finley, I'm going to sustain your objection to the video itself and just allow a crop photograph that will be accomplishing the same issue. So. Thank you, Judge. All right. Is there anything then before we bring the jury in? All right, then we are ready to bring the jury in. <clears throat> right. We are. Let's uh, let's have just a moment for us to. Uh, I've just gotten a call from the circuit court clerk over in Stewart County. I want to make sure there's not any issue before we bring the jury. Tell them, we'll let him, tell him to wait until I tell him to bring it down. I'm making sure there's not some sort of issue. I'm going to step off to find out what this call was about to make sure we don't have an issue before we bring the jury. Okay. Court is in recess. Thank you. 
All rise. Get forward and back in session. You may be seated. Let me just uh, make clear. Mr. Wallace, our circuit court clerk, where we in Dover, where or Stewart County, where we had picked the jury yesterday, had a question about making sure that everything had gone correctly and <clears throat> that there was no exposure of any of the jurors to uh, the defendant being taken from the courthouse there. And I have spoken with all of our bailiff guards and that there was no possible exposure, so there's no issues. So we are ready to go. As it was an abundance of caution that I wanted to make sure there was no issues. So. We are ready to bring the jury in as I explained. What I'm first going to do is to inquire as to whether or not they have all followed my instructions and uh, then I will place them under, will administer the jurors oath and they will be sworn and then I will give them the initial charge. We are ready to bring the jury in. Ladies and gentlemen, you can sit anywhere you want in these seats.
Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for your cooperation being here. As I explained to you yesterday, I gave you a set of initial instructions regarding your uh, requirement uh, as potential jurors to avoid any kind of uh, investigation or publicity or information about this case. And so I, today I want to ask you, have, have any of you been exposed to any information regarding this case or had anyone talk to you about this case? Have all of you followed my instructions regarding keeping uh, away from any sort of exposure to this information? If you would just signify by raising your hand that you're all in agreement. Thank you very much. All right, then at this point, we're gonna go ahead and, and place you on the roof. There's a legal requirement as to why we've done it this way to ensure that there's no issues regarding our jury. And after today, you will actually be sworn in as our jury for this trial. And that's the important part of that. It carries certain legal significance um, what we call jeopardy attaching. And so for that reason, I'm going to ask you to each stand and raise your hand, let our clerk place you under oath. Do you solemnly swear that you will well and truly try the issues joined wherein the state of Tennessee is the plaintiff and Erica Castro Miles is the defendant and a true and just verdict rendered according to the law and the evidence, so help you God. Thank you, you may be seated. Officer Claiborne, if I could give you these. Ladies and gentlemen, as I explained to you during our orientation, I'm gonna give you your own individual of this, uh, individual copy of this 15 page uh, initial charge that I'm gonna to give to you so that you can read along with me and hopefully help to you to understand it a little better. <clears throat> All right, if everyone has their copy, if read along with me. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the defendant Erica Castro Miles is charged in the indictment with the crime of premeditated first degree murder. The defendant pleads not guilty to all offenses embraced in the indictment. Before we begin the trial, I would like to tell you a little bit about what will happen during the course of these proceedings. I want to describe basically how the trial will be conducted and what the attorneys, jurors, and the judge will be doing over the course of the trial. At the end of the trial, I will give you more detailed instructions on how you're to go about reaching your decision. But now I simply want to explain how the trial will proceed. The law applicable to this case is stated in these instructions and those that follow, and it is your duty to carefully consider all of them. The order in which these instructions are given is no indication of their relative importance. You should not single out one or more of them to the exclusion of another or others but should consider each one in the light of and in harmony with the others. The defendant has been charged by the state of Tennessee with a violation of state law. The document containing the charges is referred to as an indictment. An indictment is the formal accusation charging a defendant with a crime and is not evidence of anything. The defendant is charged in the indictment with a premeditated first degree murder. State must prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant unlawfully killed the alleged victim, Sergeant Daniel Scott Baker, that the killing was intentional and that the killing was premeditated. The defendant has pled not guilty to the charge in the indictment. She is presumed innocent and may not be found guilty by you unless after hearing all of the evidence, the attorney's arguments and instructions of law, the 12 jurors seated in this case unanimously find that the state has proven this case beyond a reasonable doubt. The first step in the trial will be the attorney's opening statements. The state will tell you what uh, about the evidence it intends to present so that you will have an idea of what the state's case is about. This opening statement is not evidence. Its only purpose is to help you understand what the evidence will be and what the state will attempt to prove. After the state's opening statement, an attorney for the defendant may make an opening statement if they should so choose. Again, statements of attorneys are not evidence. Next will be the state's case in chief in which the state will present its evidence. The evidence in the case will most likely consist of physical exhibits, documents, and the testimony of witnesses. The witnesses will testify by answering questions asked by the attorneys. 
Venue of the offense lies in the county where the offense was commenced or com uh, consummated. If you find that the state has failed to prove by a preponderance of the evidence that this offense was commenced or consummated in Dixon County, Tennessee, then you must return a verdict of not guilty. After the state completes its case in chief, the defense will be given an opportunity to present evidence through witnesses and exhibits. A defendant is not required to put on any evidence or to testify. The burden is always on the state to convince you that the defendant is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. If the defense does present proof, the state may then put on what is known as rebuttal proof. After the state's rebuttal, the defense may put on further proof. After you have heard all of the evidence, the state and the defense may present final arguments. I previously told you that opening statements by the attorneys are not evidence. Likewise, closing arguments are not evidence. In closing arguments, the parties will attempt to summarize their cases and help you to understand the evidence that was presented. The final part of the trial occurs when I instruct you about the rules of law that you are to use in reaching your verdict. After you hear my instructions, the final 12 jurors will leave the courtroom together as a group. You will then begin your deliberations to make a decision in the case. Your deliberations will be secret and you will not be required to explain your verdict to anyone. Now that I have described and outlined form the trial itself, let me explain the functions that you and I will perform during the trial. I will decide which rules of law apply to the case. My decisions will be reflected in my responses to questions and objections the attorneys raised during the trial, as well as in my final jury instructions. It is your job to determine what the facts are from the evidence. You must then apply the law and my instructions to the facts, and from that application, you will arrive at a verdict. The state has the burden of proving the guilt of the defendant beyond a reasonable doubt, and this burden remains on the state throughout the entire case. Keep in mind that the defendant is presumed to be innocent of the charges against her. Thus, the defendant is not required to prove her innocence, to have her attorney make any statements or arguments, or to produce any evidence. Reasonable doubt is that doubt created by an investigation of all of the proof in the case and an inability after such investigation to let the mind rest easily as to the certainty of guilt. Absolute certainty of guilt is not demanded by the law to convict of any criminal charge, but moral certainty is required. And this certainty is required as to every element of proof necessary to constitute the offense. You as jurors must decide whether the state has proven beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant has committed the crime charged in the indictment. You must base that decision only on the evidence in the case and my instructions about the law. Witnesses will testify in response to questions from the attorneys. Witnesses are first asked questions by the party who calls the witness to testify. Then the other side is permitted to cross-examine the witnesses. Although evidence is presented by asking questions, the questions themselves are not evidence. An insinuation in a question is not evidence. You should consider a question only as it gives meaning to a witness's answer. In addition, members of the jury may ask questions of the witness if desired. The procedure for a juror to ask a question of the witness is that the question must be written down and submitted to me while the witness is on the stand. Do not put your name on the question as the questions of the jury are required to be anonymous. If a juror has a question that he or she would like to have asked of the witness, that question must be submitted in writing while the witness remains on the witness stand. At the end of the witness's testimony, the jury will be excused and I will consider the questions of the jury on the record. Then the jury will return to the courtroom. If the question is allowed by the rules of evidence, the question will be asked either by me or by one of the lawyers. You should not place any significance upon the fact that I asked the question of the witness or whether one of the lawyers asked the question. In either event, the question is being asked of the witness solely because it was desired by a juror. The wording of the question may be altered by me or the, or the question may not be asked at all. If the question is altered by me, you must assume that I had a valid legal reason for altering it, and you should place no significance upon this fact, nor should you draw any inference from it. I may refuse to ask the question at all. In that case, you likewise should place no significance upon this fact, nor should you draw any inference from it. An important part of your job will be making judgments about the testimony of the witnesses who testified. You should decide whether you believe what each person says 
and the importance of his or her testimony. In making that decision, I suggest that you ask yourself a few questions. One, did the person impress you as honest? Two, did he or she have any particular reason not to tell the truth? Three, did he or she have a personal interest in the outcome of the case? Four, did the witness have any motive, bias, or prejudice that would influence the witness's testimony? Five, did the witness seem to have a memory of the events he or she testified about? Six, did the witness have the opportunity and ability to observe accurately the things he or she testified about? Seven, did he or she appear to understand the questions clearly and answer them directly? Eight, was the witness distracted in any way? Nine, how did the witness look and act while testifying? 10, was the witness making an honest effort to tell the truth or did the witness evade questions? 11, did a witness's testimony differ from the testimony of other witnesses? Another factor for you to consider in evaluating a witness's testimony is whether the witness's testimony during the cross-examination appeared to be contradictory, unreasonable, and improbable. However, immaterial or minor discrepancies or differences should not affect the believability of a witness unless it should plainly appear that the witness has willfully testified falsely. When a witness is thus impeached, the jury has the right to disregard his or her evidence and treat it as untrue, except where it is corroborated by other credible testimony or by the facts and circumstances proved on the trial. As the sole judges of the facts, you must decide which of the witness's testimony you accept, what weight you attach to it, and what inferences you will draw from it. The law does not, however, require you to accept all of the evidence. In deciding what evidence you will accept, you must make your own evaluation of the testimony given by each of the witnesses and determine the weight you will give to that testimony. You must decide which witnesses you believe and how important you think their testimony is. You are not required to accept or reject everything a witness says. You are free to believe all, none, or part of any person's testimony. In deciding what testimony you believe, you should rely on your own common sense and everyday experience. There is no fixed set of rules to use in deciding whether you believe a witness. In making up your mind and reaching a verdict, do not base any decisions on the fact that there were more witnesses on one side than on the other. Likewise, do not reach a conclusion on a particular point just because more witnesses testified for one side on that point. Your job is to think about the testimony of each witness you heard and decide the facts. At times during the trial, an attorney may make an objection to a question that is asked by another attorney or to an answer that a witness gives. This simply means that the attorney is requesting that I make a decision on a particular rule of law. Do not draw any conclusions from the fact that an objection was made or from my ruling on that objection. My rulings only relate to the legal questions that I must determine and should not influence your thinking. If I sustain an objection to a question, the witness will not be permitted to answer the question. Do not attempt to guess what the answer might have been had the witness been permitted to give it. Similarly, if I tell you not to consider a particular statement that was made, you should put that statement out of your mind, and you may not refer to that statement in your later deliberations. In deciding this case, you may not draw any inference from an unanswered question, and you may not consider testimony that you are instructed to disregard. Any arguments about objections or motions are usually required to be made by the attorneys out of the hearing of the jury. Information may be excluded because it was not legally admissible. Excluded information cannot be considered in reaching your decision. A ruling that is made on an objection or a motion will be based solely upon the law. You must not infer from a ruling that I hold any view or opinion for or against any party in this lawsuit. Some of you have probably heard the term circumstantial evidence and direct evidence. These are the two basic types of evidence that exist in law. Direct evidence is direct proof of a fact, such as the testimony of an eyewitness. Direct evidence is those parts of the testimony admitted in court, which referred to what happened and was testified to by witnesses who saw, heard, or otherwise sensed what happened firsthand. If witnesses testified about what they themselves saw, heard or sent, otherwise sensed, they presented direct evidence. Circumstantial evidence is all of the testimony and exhibits which give you clues about what happened in an indirect way. 
It consists of all of the evidence, which is not direct evidence. Do not assume that direct evidence is always better than circumstantial evidence. According to our laws, direct evidence is not necessarily better than circumstantial evidence. Either type of evidence can prove a fact if it is convincing enough. A defendant may be convicted on direct evidence, circumstantial evidence, or both. The court will not provide you with a transcript of the testimony at the end of the trial. Therefore, you must listen very carefully to the testimony. Each of you will be allowed to take notes during the trial for your own use during your deliberations. You are not required to take notes. Independent memory can be as accurate as written notes. You will be provided with paper and a pen if you decide to take notes. During the course of the trial, you should not talk with any witness, defendant, or attorney involved in this case. Please do not talk with them about any subject whatsoever. <clears throat> you may see them in the hallway, on an elevator, or at some other location. If you do, perhaps the best standing rule is not to say anything. Do not permit any other person to discuss the case in your presence. If anyone does attempt to do so, report this fact to the court immediately without discussing the incident with any of the other jurors. You should also not discuss this case among yourselves until I instruct you on the law and you start deliberating at the end of the case. It is important that you wait until all of the evidence is received and you have heard all of my instructions on the rules of law before you deliberate among yourselves. You may not communicate with anyone or provide any information, photographs or video to anyone by any means about the case on your cell phone, through e email, Blackberry, iPhone, text messaging, Instagram, Snapchat, or on Twitter, through any blog or website, through any internet chat, internet chat room, or by way of any other social networking websites, including but not limited to Facebook, MySpace, LinkedIn, and YouTube, especially including the live stream of this trial. In keeping with the state of Tennessee's open access to the court's public policy, the majority of court proceedings are live streamed via YouTube. You as a juror are not recorded on video or shown on camera. You are not permitted to read, watch, or listen to those YouTube streams during the trial. You as jurors must base your decision solely on the evidence you hear in the courtroom. I will remind you of your duty and responsibility before all breaks and jury out hearings, and trust you will follow my instructions in keeping with the integrity of the case and the court proceedings. During the course of the trial, there will be media reports in the newspapers on TV or on radio about this particular case. If there are, you are not permitted to read, watch, or listen to those reports. You as jurors must base your decision solely on the evidence you hear in the courtroom. You will receive all of the evidence you may properly consider to decide the case. Because of this, you should not attempt to do any research on your own or gather any information on your own that you think might be helpful. Do not conduct your own private investigation into this case, although you may be tempted to do so. Do not read any textbooks or articles concerning any issue in this case or consult any other source of information. If you were to do that, you would be getting any information that is not evidence. You must decide this case solely on the evidence and law presented to you during the trial. Any juror who receives any information about this case other than that presented at trial must notify the court immediately. There are several rules concerning your conduct during the trial and during recesses that you should keep in mind. You will be a sequestered jury. You will not be allowed to communicate with anyone other than your fellow jurors and your sworn jury guards during the entire time that you serve on this jury. You will be kept together as a jury and separated from everyone else. You must not be outside the presence or supervision of your jury guards at any time. You must not speak to anyone other than your fellow jurors or guards at any time about any subject whatsoever. Second, do not discuss the case among yourselves during the trial. You must keep an open mind until you've heard all of the evidence, the attorney's closing arguments, and my final instructions concerning the law. Any discussions before the conclusion of the case would be premature and improper. Third, obey all instructions from your jury guards. They have been thoroughly instructed as to the proper procedure that must be followed. If they ask you to do something, there is a reason for it. Finally, during the course of the trial, I may have to interrupt the proceedings to confer with the attorneys about the rules of law that should apply. In some cases, they, we may have bench conferences in the courtroom outside of your hearing. And in some instances, I may ask you to retire to the jury room while we discuss a matter out of your presence. 
I will try to avoid as many of these interruptions as possible. We'll try to resolve some of these things in the morning before we get started. I ask your patience because these interruptions are necessary points in the trial where we have to resolve legal issues. In the long run, they save time for all of us. If anyone needs a break at any time, please do not hesitate to ask. Simply raise your hand. If I do not see you, get the attention of one of the bailiffs who will advise me that a juror needs a break. Normally, I will try to conclude the testimony of a witness before taking a break. The usual break times are at 10.30 in the morning and 2.30 in the afternoon, with a normal hour between 12 and 1 for lunch. If you need a break at any other time, please ask. A juror who is distracted is not paying full attention to the testimony. Both parties are entitled to your full undivided attention to the case. This completes my opening comments to you. The next phase of the trial is the formal reading to you of the indictment in this case. It's the fourth day of May, 2022, David Wolf, Circuit Judge. General. Good morning. In the Circuit Court for Dixon County, Tennessee at Charlotte, July term grand jury 2018, specially called session, June the 7th, 2018. The grand jurors of Dixon County, Tennessee, duly impaneled and sworn upon their oaths present that on or about May the 30th, 2018 in Dixon County, Tennessee, and prior to the finding of this presentment, Erica A. Castro Miles, then and there, did unlawfully, intentionally, and with premeditation kill Sergeant Daniel Scott Baker of the Dixon County Sheriff's Office in violation of Tennessee Code Annotated 3913-202 and against the peace and dignity of the state of Tennessee. Signed District Attorney Ray Crouch. And to that indictment, how does the defendant plead? The defendant pleads not guilty, Your Honor. Plea of not guilty is entered. At this point, ladies and gentlemen, we will have opening uh, statements by counsel. State wish to make an opening statement? Yes, Your Honor. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, on May the 29th of 2018, uh, the defendant, along with her boyfriend, uh, Stephen Wiggins, checked in or were staying in a hotel in Kingston Springs, Tennessee. At the time, it was called the Midtown Inn and Suites. They checked into the hotel on, on the previous night, May the 28th. And what's important about this event is it triggers uh, the death, ultimately, of Sergeant Daniel Baker on May the 30th. And here are the facts. Sometime in the early morning hours of May 29th, from the Midtown Inn and Suites in Kingston Springs, the defendant, Erica Castro Miles, calls 911 to report that Stephen Wiggins has stolen her Saturn vehicle from the parking lot of the hotel. Okay. <clears throat> the defendant also claims that Stephen Wiggins had assaulted her. Law enforcement arrives to the Midtown Inn and Suites. And you're going to see the evidence of a search of the, the defendant's hotel room in which, among other things, are located needles, drug paraphernalia, uh, marijuana, and importantly, the defendant's purse. And inside the purse, blazer, 45 caliber auto ammunition. You're going to see later in the case the same ammunition and brand as the type that was recovered that was used to murder Sergeant Daniel Baker. Now, also keep in mind, Law enforcement is there speaking with the defendant, May 29th, 2018. They're taking a report. They, in fact, get warrants against Stephen Wiggins for assault and theft of the vehicle. That's in the early morning hours. Then what you're going to see, ladies and gentlemen, is about two hours later, Stephen Wiggins drives back, and this is on video, to the hotel, goes to the door of the hotel room, knocks on the door. You will be able to see the defendant open the windows, see Stephen Wiggins, then she opens the door. They pack up their stuff in the Saturn, which has been reported stolen. Now, this is all on May 29th, 2018. They both get into the car and leave. The defendant voluntarily leaves with Stephen Wiggins. One phone call. One phone call, the evidence will show, and we wouldn't be here today had the defendant called right then as instructed by law enforcement, we would not be here today. 
But instead, the proof will show that the defendant, Erica Castro Miles and Stephen Wiggins spent the next 24 hours together in this vehicle, her vehicle, the Saturn that was reported stolen. You will see <clears throat> from testimony of witnesses and video that the defendant was voluntarily with Stephen Wiggins and throughout a 24 hour period had many, many opportunities and in fact was away from Stephen Wiggins. She was not forced to be there, she chose to be there. They acted as one in everything that they did. It's impossible to separate their actions in this case. Had the defendant Castro Miles wanted to separate from Stephen Wiggins, she could have. You will see uh, that on May 29th, the defendant went alone to AutoZone, to Ross, a store in Dixon, and to Walmart without Stephen Wiggins. She had many opportunities to call 911, call local law enforcement, call a friend, call anybody. But the facts will show she did not. She constantly reunited with Stephen Wiggins, and again, they acted as one. Which brings us to the early morning hours of May the 30th, 2018. <clears throat> Tidwell Switch Road, the intersection of Tidwell Switch Road and Sam Vineyard Road, right at 24 hours after the initial report from the Midtown Inn and Suites. And here's what we have. The facts are going to show that inside of her vehicle, the defendant's vehicle, she sat in the passenger seat and Stephen Wiggins sat in the driver's seat. That morning, just at sunrise, a passerby, a citizen, reported that two people were stopped inside this vehicle and were apparently asleep. She called 911. At that point in time, Sergeant Daniel Baker reported to the intersection to this scene to check and offer and render assistance and aid uh, to this vehicle. Inside the vehicle, again, were Stephen Wiggins and Erica Castro Miles. And here's what happened. The facts will show. Sergeant Baker approached the vehicle and asked for identification from both Stephen Wiggins and Erica Castro Miles. And at that point in time, neither of them provided identification, photograph IDs. They chose not to. In fact, you will see Stephen Wiggins gave a false or fake social security number and no identification whatsoever, although he had a photographic ID on his person. You will also see that Eric Castro Miles, instead of providing Officer Baker with her photographic ID, which she had in her possession, gave him a torn social security card. You will also see <clears throat> that there was Stephen Wiggins pretending that the driver's side door would not open. He pretended that it would not open because Officer Baker asked him to step outside the vehicle. He pretended that he needed pliers uh, to open the door from the inside. And you can see both defendants went right along with this ploy. What you will then see is Officer Baker walking around both sides of the vehicle, ultimately walking over to the passenger side where the defendant sat. And I want you to pay specific attention to the height of the mirrors. The passenger window is rolled down more than the driver window. And when Officer Baker approaches Castro Miles side of the vehicle, he is shot. He's ambushed. He's unaware that there is a pistol in the vehicle. He's shot and he runs backwards and he radios for help. You will then see Stephen Wiggins get out of the vehicle. Well, you won't see him get out of the vehicle, but you will see through Officer Baker's body cam. <clears throat> Stephen Wiggins approach Officer Baker as he's on the ground and shoot him in the head multiple times. Now, what's important in this case, again, the facts will show that Stephen Wiggins and Erica Castro Miles, they acted together and in concert to, to get away with this crime. What you're going to see is Stephen Wiggins move the patrol car vehicle near to and next to Sergeant Baker's body, at which point in time, the defendants, both Erica Castro Miles and Stephen Wiggins, crammed his body into the patrol car. Yesterday, we discussed briefly circumstantial evidence in this case, and that's why I brought it up, because I want you to pay specific attention to some of the scientific evidence in this case. On Erica Castro Miles' shirt, she's wearing a bright pink hoodie. You will see uh, blue material, polyester material from Daniel Baker's uh, uniform. It will be embedded on Eric Castro Miles' shirt. You will also see the pink fibers from her shirt 
embedded onto the pants of Sergeant Daniel Baker, which shows <clears throat> that the defendants acted together in, in manipulating and moving Sergeant Daniel Baker's patrol car vehicle. Next, what you're gonna see, ladies and gentlemen, is uh, the vehicle is, is moved and eventually dumped on Bear Creek Valley Road in, uh, at the edge of Dixon County and Hickman County. And at which point in time, it is set on fire along with the body of Sergeant Daniel Baker. Later in the day, still on May the 30th of 2018, you're gonna see that the defendant, Erica Castro Miles, is arrested. And what's important about that is that at no point in time did Erica Castro Miles call for help, seek help, try to turn herself in. What she did was run. She fled to get away from law enforcement. And she was found hiding under a shed of Mr. Adams in Hickman County, Tennessee. <clears throat> I'm summarizing a lot of the evidence that you're gonna see. And as I spent most of the day yesterday talking about the importance of paying attention and, and, and taking notes and bearing with us through this whole trial, you, you will see over the next three days why that's important. The witness's testimony and the evidence that's provided to you. <clears throat> I'm gonna ask you to pay specific attention uh, to Erica Castro Miles and her interviews and a definite and distinctive cough that she has because you will be able to hear it on the body cam of Sergeant Daniel Baker. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, at the conclusion of the evidence, I'm going to stand in front of you just like I am today and ask you to do your job to make distinctions between the truth and lies, to make distinctions between the truth and fiction. Your job is going to be able is, is to evaluate what's accurate and what's not accurate. And your job is going to be to decide whether or not the defendant is criminally responsible for the murder of Sergeant Daniel Baker. At the end of the proof, I'm going to ask you to convict her. And I'm going to ask you to convict her because all it took at any point in this process was one phone call or one action on her part, and we wouldn't be here today. Thank you. Thank you, I hate to say it, but it took me a while to figure out why exactly the government was putting Ms. Erica on trial. Uh, obviously, listening to General Crouch speak, you know, it's dawned on me, and it did a week or so ago, anyhow. He says they acted as one. They don't have a case against Erica other than her being with her abuser, Stephen Wiggins. We all know Stephen Wiggins murdered Sergeant Baker. And Stephen Wiggins is exactly where he belongs. Likewise, we all know that Erica did not murder Sergeant Baker. As General Crouch has said, she's being tried under the theory of criminal responsibility. And that's an old form of holding folks responsible for the criminal acts of another person. And I've been told by other legal scholars who are smarter than I am, that most states have done away with criminal responsibility. But we still have it here. And it's codified under TCA 3911-402. So you're going to want to be listening for proof that Erica was acting with the intent to promote or assist the commission of the offense or to benefit in the proceeds or results of the offense, and that Erica solicited, directed, aided, or attempted to aid Stephen Wiggins in this murder. That's not going to be in the evidence. When I think of criminal responsibility, I think of bank robbers and there's a getaway driver waiting for them outside. The getaway driver isn't really robbing the bank. He's not holding the teller up, but he's a vital part of the plan. Erica was not a getaway driver. The evidence will show she did not act with any intent to promote or assist in the murder of Sergeant Baker. The evidence is gonna show that she did not solicit direct aid or attempt to aid Stephen Wiggins in the murder of Sergeant Baker. You'll simply hear evidence that she was with him. 
We don't contest that fact. I don't contest the fact that she could have walked away. I do contest the fact that she could have just made a phone call. But you'll hear evidence on that as well. And this is exactly why we teach our children to be careful who they associate with. Guilty by association. It's not the law. That is not the law. It's simply a caution that we preach to our children, to our younger siblings, to our loved ones. And unfortunately, it's a warning they seldom heed. You're going to hear proof that Erica Castro Miles was an abuse victim who just maybe wasn't ready to leave her abuser. And she obviously thought she was ready to leave when she told the police as General Crouch told you, about the abuse she suffered on May 29th, 2018. You're going to hear that she was beat up, her hair was ripped out, she was choked with a hotel room phone cord, and that she had a gun held to her head. All at the hands of Stephen Wiggins, the man that the government wants you to hold Erica criminally responsible for. And Stephen Wiggins also threatened Erica's life and the lives of her children if she called the police on this night. Now, she was able to escape from this abusive situation momentarily, but she had to run naked out of her hotel room to do that. Stephen Wiggins had stripped her down, accused her of wearing a wire. And that's how scared she was. She ran out in public, naked as the day she was born, ran into the hotel manager's office, and it was the hotel clerk that called the police. It was the hotel clerk that clothed her with a towel. And all while this is happening, Stephen Wiggins steals her car. Miss Eric is gonna tell you that Mr. Wiggins broke her phone. She couldn't make a phone call. And they weren't together every hour of the following day. I realized that she could have gotten away. She didn't leave her abuser. And the government wants you to find beyond any reasonable doubt that she's criminal responsible for the actions of a man who would do this to her. And unfortunately, abusers are usually good manipulators. And unfortunately, abuse victims normally have shattered confidence, low self-esteem, they feel worthless. They sometimes even feel like it's their fault for the abuse that they suffer. So when Wiggins came back in her car that he stole from her, she realizes she was not brave enough that day to leave Stephen Wiggins. And she was probably terrified that Stephen Wiggins would find out that she talked to the police and told them what he did. So she got back into the car, which she reported as stolen. And it was stolen. Now, I don't know why she did that, other than perhaps some mixture of fear and love, or maybe just dependency. I'd say the why she got back in the car doesn't matter, but she got in the car with him, and they went off together. And as General Crouch said, there were multiple opportunities she could have got up and walked away. But for reasons unknown to me, the first time in my career looking at a domestic violence situation, we have the government refusing to acknowledge how much courage it takes abuse victims to just walk away. And so Stephen Wiggins drove Erica's car around until they get this flat tire, as General Crouch pointed out. And they passed out in the car. And they stopped almost practically in the middle of an intersection. And Erica fell asleep in the car. And a concerned citizen, a concerned citizen, is the one who makes this phone call that directly leads to Sergeant Baker arriving on the scene. Now, what you're also going to hear in this video is a car door begin to open. <coughs> Sergeant Baker tell Erica to get back in the car. Now, you won't be able to tell which one of them's opening the door, but with Wiggins pretending the door doesn't work, obviously it's Erica trying to get out of the car. And she was doing that at Stephen Wiggins' direction. Get out of the car, go tell them we have a flat tire. Tell them we don't need any help. She tried to do that. She was following the 
the directions, the order of her abuser. It wasn't the other way around. Stephen Wiggins was not following her directions or orders. And she listened to what Sergeant Baker said. And she just sat there. And she didn't say a word. And while Stephen Wiggins lies over and over to Sergeant Baker about the car door, I think he even lied about his name and social security number. While Stephen Wiggins is continuing to manipulate this situation, she says nothing. He's sitting right there next to her. And Stephen Wiggins continues to manipulate this situation. And when Sergeant Baker turns his back for a moment, Stephen Wiggins shoots Sergeant Baker. And as Stephen Wiggins is shooting Sergeant Baker, there are shell casings flying into the face of Erica. How shocked she must have been. Stephen Wiggins is a coward. He shot a man in the back. I don't know if it was directly in the back, but his back was turned. He's a coward for that. He's a coward for beating up on a woman. He's a vicious, violent bully. Now, that's true. Erica didn't tell Sergeant Baker what was going on. She didn't have the courage to do that. She doesn't say anything about her just getting beat up the night before. She doesn't say anything about her taking a warrant out for him. And this is what the government faults her for. For not speaking out against this monster who beat her up, who choked her, who put a gun to her head. They're in the same car. If she actually spoke up, how much damage could he have inflicted on her before Sergeant Baker could have separated them? Would he have killed her too? Or maybe he just would have killed her instead. You see, Erica is not the hero that Sergeant Baker is. She was a powerless victim in that situation. And yet the government wants you to hold this helpless victim responsible for the actions of her abuser. What a terrible precedent they seek to set. All right, so stay ready to call his first witness. Stay close, Lisa Baker. Baker, if you'll come around, please. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give me? The whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God. Can you state your full name for the court, please? Lisa Schrock Baker. Thank you. And Ms. Baker, what is your relationship, <clears throat> excuse me, relationship to Sergeant Daniel Baker? He's my husband. I'm his widow. And uh, when did you get married? Um, 2014. Uh, how old was uh, Sergeant Baker when he was murdered? Um, he was, he had just turned 32. 32 years old. Uh, and did you and Sergeant Baker have any children together? Yes, we have one daughter. And what is her name? Meredith. And how old was Meredith at the time of Sergeant Baker's murder? Um, she is, she was 22 months old. Okay. Um, I want to take you back to May uh, of 2018. Uh, do you remember the morning of May 30th, 2018? Yes. What, what were you doing that morning? Um, getting ready. I got ready for work, took Meredith to daycare, went, went to work. And do you remember what shift your husband, Sergeant Baker, was working uh, on May 30th, 2018? Um, the day shift. Uh, do you know about what time his shift would start in the mornings? Normally around 6.30 or 6.45, but. Did you and Sergeant Baker have kind of a, a morning routine? Uh, usually, yes. What, what did y'all do? Um, well, he would get up and, and get ready before, uh, before me, like shower before me, and then he would, he would leave before I left, but. Um, uh, usually when he would leave, then I would, I would get ready. Okay. So on the morning of May the 30th, 2018, did uh, do you remember the last thing that you said or interaction with your husband? 
Um, I remember that I was in the kitchen and that I, I had made coffee and uh, he always took a drink of my coffee because he would aggravate me. And then he left for work? Mm -hmm. And you left for work shortly after that? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, where were you when you learned uh, of, of your husband's murder? I was at work. And can you tell us how you were notified? Um, a co-worker of Daniel that's a close family friend, um, Kenny Monson, he came and got me at work. Okay. Uh, and, I, and I guess <clears throat> the rest of the day, uh, you, what did blur. you do? Yeah, it was blur. a blur. Um, I, we left my house and, I mean, we left work and we went to my house. And at that point in time, we thought that we would be um, gathering clothes and things to head towards to the hospital, that we would be probably at a hospital for an unknown amount of time. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> did you know at that point in time that there was a manhunt for two people? No. When, when were you told that there was a, a manhunt going on? Uh, sometimes shortly after that. I'm, I'm not certain. I know that we didn't have the TV on. Yeah. Okay. So <clears throat> let me take you back uh, to before May 30th of 2018. At, at some point, did you uh, buy Sergeant Baker, your husband, a Christmas present that is a, a weapon of some type? Yes, I bought him uh, his backup weapon. His, a, his backup weapon? Mm -hmm. uh, and what was his backup weapon? Uh, 357 Glock. And you, did you give that to him as a gift? I did, yes. And do you remember where you purchased it from? Um, the Sportsman store in Dixon. Okay. Uh, do you remember what year that was that you gave it to him? I, we, it was one of our first Christmases, so. But it was before May 30th, 2018? Yes, it was probably 2012 or 2013. And did he carry his backup weapon every day? Usually, yeah. If it wasn't on him, he in his patrol car at least. Okay. Um, now I'm going to, Your Honor, may I approach the witness? May. <clears throat> you identify this photograph, please. Um, yes, this is a picture of um, myself and Daniel at my sister's wedding. Okay. Uh, and is the photograph in your hand uh, the same photograph that we see on the screen? Yes. And that's you on the left? Yes. And Sergeant Baker on the right? Yes. Is this the typical style uniform that Sergeant Baker would wear to work every day? Yes. And uh, is that a blue shirt? Yes. What color were the pants? Uh, a darker blue. Darker blue. And I may have said black earlier, but they're dark blue. I believe so. Yeah. <clears throat> and just briefly, can you identify what this piece of equipment is here? It's a um, light mail. Uh, the, the radio, is that what you're pointing yeah, at? Is this a radio? Yes. Is this called a duty belt that he has on? Yes. There's different pieces of equipment that he would carry? Yes. What, what were some of the pieces of equipment that, that your husband would carry every day? The, well, the radio and the flashlight. You can see in there. Okay. And then um, the other side would have his uh, service weapon and the ASP. Okay. So in this photograph, we can just see the radio and the flashlight. Mm -hmm. That was part of his everyday uh, uniform equipment. Yes. Okay. I'll move that photograph as the first exhibit, please. Mark it as exhibit. I think it's actually, we've marked uh, one other issue as exhibit one, so we'll mark this as exhibit Thank two. You. all the questions I have from Ms. Baker at this time. Mr. Finley, is there any questions? I don't have any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Baker. You missed it there. Thank you, call your next witness. The state calls Brian Hudnall. <laughs>
Brother, will you come up, please? Raise your right hand and face our clerk. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, can you state your full name for the court, please? Brian Scott Hudnall. And will you spell your last name? H U D N A O L. Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> Mr. Hudnall, you are uh, here today uh, under subpoena from the state of Tennessee. Is that correct? Correct. And are you familiar with a Mr. Stephen Wiggins and Erica Castro Miles? Yes, sir. And I want to right, pull that microphone towards you a little bit and make sure you speak into it. Thank All you. right. Uh, so my question was, are you familiar with Mr. Stephen Wiggins and Ms. Erica Castro Miles? Yes, sir. And do you see Erica Castro Miles in the courtroom today? Yes, sir. What's that? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Now, Mr. Hudnall, I want to take your attention back to the first week or first weekend in May of 2018. Uh, did Stephen Wiggins and the defendant Erica Castro Miles come to your house? Yes, sir. And uh, did they come to your house in a vehicle that uh, was a, a Saturn, I think, S-Series? I'm not sure the series, but it was a Saturn. Okay. Who, who was in the vehicle? He was driving. She was in the passenger seat. Okay. Stephen Wiggins was driving, mm -hmm. and Erica Castro Miles uh, was in the passenger seat. Yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> During this inter and, and this was at your house, is that correct? Correct. <clears throat> During this interaction, did the defendant Stephen Wiggins uh, show you a 45 caliber weapon? He didn't show me. It was sitting in his lap. It was sitting in his lap. Okay. Uh, and did you say something to him about the 45 caliber? I did. What did you say? I just told him it was crazy to be riding around like that. You told him it was crazy to be riding around like that? Yeah. And what did he say? Sir, I object to what Mr. Wiggins would say. He's not a party here. Okay. Judge, I'm taking it it's an objection to hearsay, and it's not for the truth of the matter asserted. Look, you want to respond? It's being presented for the truth of the matter. Absolutely, it is. Ladies and gentlemen, if you'll step over across the hallway, please. All right, I'm going to take this up outside the jury just to make sure. But your um, your objection is as to the statement is hearsay, and what is the state's purpose in introducing the statement? What exception to the hearsay rule would you rely upon? Well, we're <clears throat> lying. To this is first not uh, a statement made for the truth of the matter asserted, but not but more than that. There's two exceptions. This is actually a party adoption, and we would like the court to refer to Heflin versus State. Uh, court of Criminal Appeals opinion that references adopting your co-defendant's statement and uh, make, provide a copy of that. To the mm -hmm.
But in, re in reference to uh, this particular case, which is State versus Heflin, the language that I found applicable is on the last page of the decision. And it actually quotes um, the court. This is a post, the first copy I have is a post conviction relief. I guess it's the same thing. It's a, a question of post conviction relief regarding the alleged inefficient, inefficient um, ineffective assistance of counsel. And it was regarding the uh, failure to object to the testimony of, of a co-defendant regarding a statement that she and the petitioner planned to kill Al Wilson for the insurance money. And the court stated on direct appeal that indeed after Mrs. Holder testified, Ms. Wilson stated that she and the defendant were going to kill Mr. Wilson for the insurance money. Ms. Holder testified the defendant agreed with everything she said. Ms. Holder's testimony about Ms. Wilson's statement was clearly admissible because the statement was one in which the defendant had manifested an adoption or belief in its truth. Therefore, even though Ms. Wilson's statement was improperly admitted through the testimony of Mr. Holder, the defendant was not prejudiced because the same evidence was properly admitted through the testimony of Ms. Holder. So <clears throat> it's an adoption of, of my understanding is, is that what you're relying upon do you, uh, does this witness intend to testify that some affirmation of that statement by Castro Miles? Yes, Judge, and that's why this is kind of a, a hybrid exception because the first part of his statement is not asserted for the truth of the actual statement, It's but it does put in context the adoption that the defendant uh, Castro Miles makes by nodding and shaking her head yes in agreement to what Wigan says, which is, we, I will smoke the next police officer that tries to arrest me. Outside the presence of the jury, let's allow your, uh, I'm going to allow you to ask those questions for me to make a determination on the admissibility. So, Mr. Hudnall, let me go through a series of questions with you. When you ask uh, Stephen Wiggins or said something to him about the 45 in his lap, what did he say? He said, if anybody messes with me, I'll smoke their ass. Okay. Uh, and, and what did the co-defendant, Erica Castro-Miles, do or say or react when he said that? I don't know what she did. Okay, so do you remember giving previous testimony in this case? I do, but uh, it's been so long, I don't remember what she did in the car. Okay, well, <clears throat> let me question them. Uh, may I approach the witness? No. So, Mr. Hudnall, you're now looking at the transcript of your previous testimony in this case, and... I can't read this. I, I have written off the DMIs now. My vision's blurry. My so diabetes. You can't read it at all? No, sir. All right. So, how about I read it to you, and you agree to whether it's accurate or not, okay? So, my question to you, Mr. Hudnall, in this previous testimony... <clears throat> was how did you make contact with law enforcement? You see, you can't see that part, right? Right. All right. Uh, your, your answer on line 18, I had noticed a pistol in his lap and I had said something to the effect of, you don't need to be riding around like that. You'll end up going to jail for that. And he said, I'm not going to jail because he'd get like 13 year sentence. He said, if anybody tried to arrest him, he would smoke them. That sound accurate? Okay. And then the question back to you for me was, he said, if anybody tried to arrest me, I would smoke them. And your answer on line one of page 130 is, he would smoke them, yes, sir. My question to you on line two, talking about law enforcement arresting him, your answer on line four, if anybody tried to arrest him. Question, did you see the pistol? Answer, yes, sir. Question, and you heard Wiggins say this. Answer, yes, sir. Question, who was with Wiggins? Your answer, the girl, Erica. Question, who? Answer, Erica. Question, did you see her in the courtroom today? Your answer, yes, sir. Question, is she seated at this table? Your answer, yes, sir. My question to you, did she hear a, <clears throat> the defendant say, if anybody tries to arrest me, I'm going to smoke them? And your answer was, yes, sir. My question to you then was, and what did she do when Wiggins said that? Your answer was just sat there, she nodded. My question to you, how did she nod? Answer, just, then I questioned affirmatively, like yes, and your answer was yes, sir. 
And then my question, did you see, did you see her nod her head affirmatively, affirmatively? And your answer was, yes, sir. My question, as in yes, and your answer again is, yes, sir. Then I ask you, are you absolutely sure she heard Stephen Wiggins say, if somebody tries to arrest me, I'm going to smoke them? And your answer was, yeah. yes. Sorry to interrupt, but I, I have to object to that. I mean, how could this witness know what she heard? Now, I understand he's just reading this to refresh recollection, but the basis of that is ridiculous. This witness cannot testify to what my client supposedly heard. Well, the purpose of what Mr. Crouch is doing at this point is to refresh, it's a refreshing of the memory of the witness by prior uh, recorded testimony or prior recorded statement. So your objection as to the nature of that statement would seem to me to be premature. Certainly it can be explored on cross-examination, but I don't think that, that that goes more to the cross-examination rather than to the admissibility of, of what uh, General Crouch is questioning. This is prior testimony from the prior, from the Wiggins trial, is that correct? You know, this is uh, testimony from Ms. Castro and Miles Bond here. Bond here, all right. I thought it was a prelim. Um, overrule any objection as to this stage of this proceeding. Now that, that we have determined that, uh, what is your uh, uh, response to the objection as to the admissibility of the statement by Mr. Wiggins? Mr. Finley's, which is what we're dealing with, Initially, it was Mr. Finley's objection as to the admissibility of that statement. Well, <clears throat> Your Honor, this is a prior recorded sworn testimony. And the issue now is not whether it's, <laughs> quite frankly, not of admissibility, but of uh, the witness's statement that he can't read it. So uh, being that he has some type of, I guess, eye issue. But, but, but we've got two issues. One of them is, Certainly he can, if you've now refreshed his recollection, he can testify from that refreshed recollection of his prior statement. Then it brings us to the point of the objection by Mr. Finley as to the admissibility of that statement that uh, Mr. Wiggins made. And it's my understanding that your argument is that it was a statement essentially of a party opponent, yes. uh, which is an exception to the hearsay rule because your argument under this case law that you cited is that it has been adopted by Ms. Cash, the statement by Mr. Wiggins that he's going to smoke the whoever that was trying to arrest him was adopted by Ms. Wiggins based on her, I'm sorry, by Ms. Castro Miles by her nodding an affirmation to that statement. Yes. Is that correct? That is correct. And based upon that, I want to hear from Mr. Finley any other argument he uses, he wishes to make. Your Honor. I'd have to ask Mr. Hudnall, do you remember this conversation with Mr. Wiggins now? Yes, sir. Did you take it serious? I took it serious. You didn't call law enforcement that day? No. And now, can you really sit here and say what she heard or didn't hear? I can't say what she heard or didn't hear, but she did nod in the car. She nodded in the car. You suddenly remember now. So, do you know why she was nodding? No. Did she say anything verbally? Never talked to her. He never said, yeah, that's right. We're going to get somebody if they try to arrest him or me. No, sir. Okay. Well, Judge, she didn't, man. I, I would argue she didn't adopt that statement. She, if she's, I don't know if she was listening to music or why she may have nodded, or she may not even know or recall this particular event. She hadn't testified yet. But Mr. Hudnall cannot say she manifested an adoption of this hearsay statement. So I absolutely it's in it, Mr. Judge. <clears throat> I'm not asking Mr. Hudnall to testify that she manifested or adopted the statement. I'm asking Mr. Hudnall to testify as to her reaction, what she did uh, in response to his statement to Mr. Wiggins, which was nod her head affirmatively. The that, that, that goes to the jury, Your Honor. It's not an admissibility issue. It's for the jury to decide what weight they place on her nodding her head. Mr. Finley can say, well, she was nodding because she saw a bird or, or, or whatever, but I think Mr. Finley's objection goes more towards um, what he may explore on cross-examination than to the admissibility of it. The uh, admission of a party opponent is the exception to the hearsay rule that I am allowing this particular statement to come in. Um, clearly, if she was sitting in the, in the vehicle with Mr. Wiggins when the statement was made and uh, she nods 
to, uh, in response to that statement, at least according to this witness's testimony, then that's uh, a fact that the jury can uh, accept or they can reject. Uh, when Mr. Finley cross-examines this witness, they may reject the conclusion that she nodded in affirmation and therefore the statement was not a, a, a reflecting of her intent. Or they may find that it is in fact an affirmation of her acceptance of that statement by Mr. Trudeau. But it does not, in my opinion, affect the admissibility of the exception to the uh, hearsay rule as a party opponent, as well as under the state versus Heflin, Heflin 15 Southwest 3rd at 523, the section that I read, which is basically an adoption of the statement uh, by Mr. Wiggins by that person. So we're uh, having concluded this matter outside the presence of the jury, we're ready to bring the jury back in. My ruling is, is that the statement would be admissible. Uh, Mr. Hudnall can testify now and he can uh, be cross-examined on the fact that his, uh, I believe the refreshing his recollection occurred outside the presence of the jury, but I think it would be fair game for Mr. Finley to be able to question him on cross-examination about the fact that his recollection of that was not clear and that he had to have his recollection refreshed on uh, by the, his prior testimony, if that's how you wish to proceed. It's up to you, but I will allow that to take place. All right. Judge, and while the jury is out, uh, we've had a, I guess, a pretrial issue directing Mr. Hudnall not to talk about a drug transaction. So I want to. Mr. Hudnall, you remember that the, the first time you testified, we instructed you specifically. I don't want to hear anything about drug transactions at all in this testimony. I don't care what happens. Do not let that word come from your mouth. You understand yes, that? Yes, sir. All right. I think we're all on the same page. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I took a matter up outside of your presence so that I can make a determination. Uh, and I have made a ruling that uh, really just relates to the legal admissibility of certain evidence. You shouldn't concern yourself as I instructed you when I do that. Don't try to guess what it was that I did outside your presence. Just trust me that I've done what I think is the right thing. It's on me to make that decision. Thank you. And we may continue. Okay, Mr. Hudnall, just to put this back in context, we're talking about the first week or so of May. Is that correct? Correct of 2018, and this is at your house. Correct. And you see a pistol in the lap of uh, Stephen Wiggins, is that correct? Yes. And they are inside of this Saturn vehicle. Yes. And, and Erica Castro Miles is in the passenger seat. Yes. And you say to Stephen Wiggins something about what? You caught riding with a pistol like that, you're going to jail. Okay, and what did he say back in response? Not going to jail. If anybody messes with me, I'll smoke their ass. Said he would smoke their ass. He wasn't going to jail. Right. And did you see the defendant, Eric Castro Miles, uh, say or respond in any way? She nodded in agreement. She nodded in agreement. And did you see her head move up and down as in affirmatively? Yes, sir. You did? I couldn't hear you. Yes, sir. Okay. Now, <clears throat> At that point in time, uh, did did Stephen Wiggins, did you know him as Stephen Wiggins? Um, I know him as Stephen. Okay. Did he have a nickname? I don't know if he 
idea. Okay. Thank you. I'll pass the witness. Finley. Mr. Hudnell, correct? Correct. Now, Mr. Hudnell, you had to have your memory refreshed about this particular situation, correct? Correct. You didn't remember it? Correct. I remember the situation, not everything. You don't remember all the details? Correct. Okay. So as you sit here today, you remember what Erica did? you remember if music was playing or anything like that? I don't remember if any music was playing. Okay. Your folks, if they're sitting in the car, they're kind of nodding along to music sometimes, aren't they? I can't say. You, do you ever do that? I listen to music. Okay, and you've, not, you've never nodded along with a song or something? Yes. All right, so folks do that is what I'm saying. Okay. And you don't know whether that was happening that day or not. I don't. Okay, you don't know why she nodded her head. No. Okay. And now I'm going to have to ask you some questions about your history. Okay, I'm not trying to be rude to you or anything. I understand bad things happen, right? But you've been convicted of some different felonies here Correct. in this county. Correct. And I've seen a couple of aggravated burglaries, I think a burglary here and there, correct? Right. Now, you were on probation when Sergeant Baker was shot and killed, right? I was in jail. You were in the jail. You were on a violation. Right. Okay. And later on in January of 2019, you entered a guilty plea to aggravated burglary, theft, and possession of a handgun, all from the same occurrence, right? Right. Okay. And you got a pretty good deal on that, didn't you? My deal was before this. It was before this? I got accepted into drug court. You got accepted into drug court? That's going well for you, I hope. Yeah, I'm finished, completed. Good. Now, you went to the government with this information about Stephen. Correct. You wanted to cut a deal. Correct. And you, this was done. You went to the government about November of 2018. I'm not sure on the dates. No, okay. I know you'd said you have some eye trouble, but do you remember getting on the kiosk and requesting to talk to a detective? I do. Okay. And would you agree with me that you did that November 23rd, 2018 at 4.01 p.m.? Correct. That sounds right? Sounds right. Okay. Now, this is several months after Sergeant Baker was killed. Correct. Okay. Now, was Stephen in the jail with you at the time? Or no. Anything? Okay. So... You went to the police with this information and you wanted to be on probation again. You wanted out of jail, right? I never said what I wanted. You don't remember telling the detective that you wanted to be on probation or anything like that? No, sir. Well, that is what you wanted, though, isn't it? You'd rather got out of jail that day. Yeah. Okay. So that's what you were trying to do, cutting a deal. Yes. Okay. Now... You had testified that you went directly to the police after you heard Sergeant Baker was killed, but that's not right. It was several months after the fact, wasn't it? Yeah, I wasn't sure on the dates. That's fine. Now, have you ever been to prison? Yes. It sounds terrible when those loud metal doors close behind you, doesn't it? Sure. Everybody. That lock latching behind you. Must have felt like you'd never get out of there. No. You don't like the food in the jail or in the prison either, I'm sure, right? I think anybody does. Not like mom's cooking, right? You have to wear the same rags that everybody else around you is wearing. I don't shower very often. That's how it is in jail and in prison, isn't it? Shower anytime you want. But not everybody's showering like they should, though, right? It's cold, gets hot, extreme temperatures. Not everybody has the best hygiene, right? Pretty scary in jail, isn't it? To some. Pretty scary in prison? To some. You must not have wanted to go back to prison when you were making this deal, though, right? Right. You got family? I do. Kids? Yep. How many? One. You do anything for your kid, wouldn't you? Yeah. When you were in jail, did you cry? You didn't oh, miss my your, kid. 
Got your kid? You missed your kid though, right? Yes. What do you like to do for fun? I hate for fun. No? Not a lot of fun in prison and jail though, is it? You'd have done just about anything to avoid going to prison. No. No? You wouldn't do just about anything to be there for your child? Yeah. Not gonna lie about it. <clears throat> of course, what your testimony is, Stephen Wiggins is making some statement, some boasting, you know, male bravado, right? Right. Now, you didn't call the law immediately. No. You didn't think he was gonna really kill a police officer, did you? No. But the government wants you to convince these folks that Erica thought he was serious. Right? I can't say what the government wanted. But you don't know what was going through Erica's mind. You don't even know if she heard him say it. Correct. I already said that. Did you know that Stephen Wiggins was abusive to Erica? Did he beat her up? Held guns to her head? Thank you. Mr. Hudnall, you've kind of been down this road before with this line of questioning, right? Uh, and it's kind of go through it again. Uh, is what you've testified to today the truth? Absolutely. That uh, when you confronted Stephen Wiggins about that 45 caliber pistol and he said he was going to smoke their ass in reference to anybody that tried to arrest him, you observed this defendant nod affirmatively yes. Yes. That's the truth. True. Now, let's go to uh, what Mr. Finley has been questioning you about. Uh, you have been convicted of some felonies. Uh, you admitted your criminal responsibility for crimes. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And you served your time. Yes, sir. Uh, you, did you make a deal with the state uh, to come here and testify today? No, sir. In fact, I looked back at the previous questioning. One of my questions to you was, Mr. Huddle, do you even know who I am? No, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't make a deal with you, did I? Mm -hmm. Ross? No, Judge. Thank you, Mr. Hudnall. You may step down. Are we releasing him from the subpoena? Yes, sir. You will be released from your subpoena and go about your business. Do you have another short witness before we take a recess? It's fairly short. All right. Front of the state calls Courtney Proctor. Put up here, please. Man. You face our clerk and raise your right hand. Please, Mr. Officer, or affirming the testimony you're about to give in this case to be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. So help you, God. Yes. Who will please speak directly into that microphone so it'll pick up? So good morning, Ms. Proctor. Good morning. Um, for the record, could you please state your name and spell your last name for the court reporter? Courtney Proctor, P-R-O-C-T-O-R. And Ms. Proctor, how are you currently employed? I'm the Assistant Director at Cheatham County 911. Okay. Now let's talk a little bit about your background um, in the 911. How long have you worked for Cheatham County 911? 20 years. And in the course of the job at 911, I mean, to be fair, this is dispatch, is that correct? Yes. What are the job duties of a dispatcher? 
Um, we take emergency calls, non-emergency calls, inner warrants, um, dispatch fire police and medical. Okay. And in your course of your normal job operations, um, when a call comes in, is it recorded? Yes. And how, how is that recorded in the system? We've got a, um, when we answer the phone call and we take it, then it just starts being recorded. And are those recordings kept? Yes. And along with the recording, when a dispatcher answers the phone, um, do they go ahead and start uh, a complaint card or a CAD report? Yes. Could you please explain to the jury what a CAD report is? It basically is something that shows um, the address of the call, the caller name, the phone number, and the narrative for any kind of call that we have. Does it also have notes that the dispatcher puts in there as well? Yes. And is that based on information that that dispatcher receives on the call or from law enforcement calling in? Yes. And along with the CAD report, does it also show you which unit, I say units, which officers or EMS or emergency services people have also responded to this particular incident? Yes, ma'am. And that's all listed together? Yes. Your Honor, if I could approach the witness, please. You may. So, Ms. Proctor, I've handed you a, a CAD operations report. Do you recognize this CAD operations report? Yes. Um, do you have a date and a time that the initial call came in on it? The date is going to be May the 29th, 2018, and the time that the call came in is 5.39 a.m. Okay. Does it also tell you an address for this incident? Yes. And what is that address? 129 Liven Hills Road, and it says the room number is 121. That's the Econo Lodge in Kingston Springs. Does it also go by the name of the Midtown Inn and Suites now? Yes. Or at the time? Yes. Okay. And is that the CAD report? Is that the complete CAD report? If you could just look through the pages, please. Yes, ma'am. And that's the CAD report for a, an incident at the Kingston, Kingston Springs, Midtown Inn and Suites. I believe the caller name on there is Leah, is that correct? Yes. Um, and does it have any parties listed? The subject names that were ran on the call, is that what you're Yes, ma'am. Yes. And what are they? Stephen J. Wiggins and Erica Castro-Miles. All right. Your Honor, I move this to State's Exhibit Number 3, please. Yeah. Marked as Exhibit 3. Now, dispatcher, well, I say dispatcher, assistant, <laughs> assistant director, proctor, um, is there a 911 call that goes along with this CAT report? Yes, ma'am. And have you listened to that call? Yes, ma'am. Have you listened to this to see if you recognize this? Hey, can you send the police to Midtown Suites? I have a guy in one of the rooms here who's got a gun. Oh, well, he, he just he sued this girl out with no clothes on. So I've got her in the office here. And he's in the room. What kind of gun does he have? What kind of gun is it? <laughs> she doesn't know. What was he doing? Are, are they, they close by? Or? Huh? Were they drinking or what were they doing that started this? Have y'all been drinking? <laughs> no. Uh-uh. Okay, what were, what were they doing that started this? I don't know, sir. What started it? I don't know. He just lost his mind. He just lost his mind. Is he doing drugs? No, no drugs. No alcohol. Okay. What room is he in? What room is it? 121. All right, hang on one second. Don't hang on. Down here naked in the office. I had to throw a towel on. Yeah, hang on one second, okay? Thank you. Yeah, I went to the bathroom. Oh, no, I'm not sure. I thought you were. <laughs> 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 
could be her boyfriend or her husband or kind of sort of okay what's his name she didn't know his last name or can't think of it she's pretty upset yeah i hear it. and what was your name <laughs> my name is lear i worked third she's a it's like I'm always calling you. Okay, that's fine. And she she wouldn't hurt or anything. She doesn't need an ambulance. You need an ambulance, honey? No. no. Okay. And what's your callback number? Is I look it up. It is six one six one five nine five two twenty nine hundred. Nine five two two nine zero zero. Yes, sir. Okay. She just said he left. Fourteen in. In her car, it's a ninety-eight. Here, hold on a minute. It's a ninety-eight Saturn Series license plate BRY three one zero. Okay, he said it's a ninety-eight Saturn. Yeah, he just color. got on the interstate. He's probably headed towards Dixon. Okay. <laughs> what color is it, ma'am? It's brown and it's got puppy paws on the driver's side back window and uh, live love and pet on the passenger side rear window. And it's got a California flag that's a sugar soul on the middle of the of the windshield. <laughs> so you think you're possibly headed back towards Dixon? To yeah, probably. I'm not sure. She has all my stuff in the car. Okay. <laughs> okay. And you don't know his last name? <laughs> I, I can't think of it at the moment. Wait the office with the lady. We got a couple officers on the way to speak to him. If he shows back up, just call him back, okay? Okay. All right, thank you. <laughs> now, Director Pratchett, is that the 911 call that goes with this cat report? Yes. Can I make, move a copy of that as exhibit number four, please? Marked as exhibit four. And this is Director Proctor. There are two things I'm going to ask you about in there. Um, the callers never said the subject's last name in the call, correct? Right. And um, the lady at the end acknowledged that if the that if the vehicle came back, that she was to call the police, and she said she would. She would, correct? Yes, ma'am. Pass it, Mr. Ryan. Any questions? I have any questions? Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. You may step down. You are released from your subpoena. Go ahead and take our good morning recess this morning. Uh, we'll stand at recess for fifteen minutes. All rise. <laughs> Scores and recess.
Let's uh, go ahead and bring the defendant out. Hold on. Don't bring the jury in until we tell you, okay? I assume you knew I said that earlier, though. Yes, sir. I wanted to uh, bring up one clarification. We had a pretrial 404B a hearing and ruling. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead and say it. <clears throat> oh, I thought she came in. I thought I heard. Well, <clears throat> if it's something we need to do on the record, we need to defend it. If it's something off the record, then we don't necessarily have to defend it. Well, we had a let's just do it on the record. I don't know. Always better to do it on the record so that there's no, no question about it. Uh, just communicating to me that uh, we have a couple of the jurors who smoke and it's taking longer to take them out and let them have a smoke and the bailiffs have to guard them so we only have a certain number of people to do what we need to do so we will wait patiently Now that we have Pastor Miles back in here, Mr. Crouch, you want to address that issue? Yes, uh, Judge, you've previously ruled on the 404B motion. The state intends to offer copies, certified copies of the two citations that were issued to uh, the defendant uh, through our next witness. Just wanted to make sure that was in the scope of the ruling. Really? You had objected at the time to the introduction of any of that evidence. Yes, Your Honor. Um, it, it was already mentioned in opening that there were those things there. And I, I think it falls within the scope of my ruling on the 404B that it sets, um, it, it's essential to the state's theory of the case and therefore any, uh, probative, any probative value and relevance outweighs any prejudice. And I don't, you know, hopefully the jury wouldn't take, take it too serious, but I understand the situation. So here we are. It's been mentioned in opening. I'm not going to object at this point since it's already been talked about. So. We'll, we'll just note that your objection to the original 404B information is covered, covers this as well without you having to make a further objection. Right, Judge. And as soon as we get our jury all situated, we'll be back on the record and start from there. Does the court, is the court planning on a, a noon lunch? We're I'm, I'm normally we'll go to noon. It's my understanding they're bringing lunch in for the jury. Is that right? About noon, they'll have their food here. So my inclination is always to, you know, try to go ahead and 
and take it around noon. And um, with them having the food brought in, it may expedite the lunch hour. I know we usually will take a little longer than an hour, so we may take an hour and 10 minutes or something on that order. And then I do have a, um, this afternoon's somewhere around the three o'clock, I need to take a little bit of a longer break. There's a, an obligation. Sometimes you obligate yourself to do things and I have an obligation to speak to a group of the uh, leadership of Dixon County for very briefly. Um, and they're supposed to be here around three. So we'll, we'll I'll talk fast. <clears throat> Which apparently, <clears throat> I was, I probably shouldn't be saying this on the record anyway, but apparently, have you, I cannot voice text anything on my phone because apparently I have an accent that it just, whatever I say, it comes out completely different than what I think it's supposed to say. So I don't know if they make a Siri adaptation for a Southern accent or not, but apparently I need one. So when I say I'll talk fast, I'll talk fast for me at least. Are they ready? Yeah. All right, let's bring them. We have everyone back on the group. So, Roger, call your next witness. I'm going to stay close to TC Swaggerty. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, they may have told you we're bringing lunch in for you, so you'll be able to, to stay here and uh, have a lunch. And it's the same group that we've brought in before, and we've not had any complaints thus far. Y'all are like chitlin. <laughs> <laughs> That's from Dover, no chitlin. <laughs> Sure, if you'll step right up here, please. <clears throat> right around here, raise your right hand and face our floor. Thank you. 
you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give in this case to be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help you lie. Good morning. Morning. So, Officer Swaggerty, would you state your first and last name, please? Tony Swaggerty. Can we spell your last name, please? S W A G G E R T Y. Thank you very much. Uh, Officer Swaggerty, you are employed by the Kingston Springs Police Department? Yes. And how long have you been employed with Kingston Springs Police Department? 26 years. Okay. Uh, do you have a position or a title at the police department? I'm a patrol officer. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> officer Swaggerty, I'll take you back to May 29th of 2018. Were you working for Kingston Springs Police Department on that day? Yes. And did you respond to a call at the Midtown Inn and Suites? Yes. And did you make contact with uh, Erica Castro Miles? Yes. Uh, do you remember uh, why you were called and why you made contact with Erica Castro Miles? Yeah, I responded on a domestic. When she was uh, aggravated, assaulted. Okay. And do you remember was uh, the defendant, Miss Miles, was she staying in room 121 of the Midtown Inn and Suites? Yes. Uh, do you know who was staying in that room with her? Uh, Stephen Wiggins. Uh, was Stephen Wiggins present when you arrived? No. Okay. Did you get a chance to actually go into the hotel room that was occupied by the defendant, Erica Castro Miles? Yes. All right. Can you describe what you saw when you entered the hotel room? Mm, I've seen some marijuana, needles, and other paraphernalia. Paraphernalia? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, see anything else? I have some ammo. Ammo? Yeah. Ammunition? Right. Okay. It's 45 caliber. 45 caliber ammunition? Uh, did you see a purse that uh, belonged to the defendant, Erica Castro Miles? Yes. Uh, and did you have the opportunity with her permission to look inside the purse? I did. And what did you find? There was some 45 ammunition in the adults. 45 caliber ammunition? Your Honor, may I approach the witness? You may. Officer, can you identify this, please? Yeah. Is that a sealed evidence bag? It is. And it's some on some part of that bag is your name listed, T.C. Swaggerty? It's handwritten in black ink, I believe. Yes. Yeah. And at some point, you relinquished uh, control of this evidence bag over to the TBI. Is that correct? I did. All right. Is this the same ammunition that you collected from the defendant's purse on May 29th of 2018? Yes. And I don't want you to open the bag, but if you could look through the bag and look at the specific pieces of ammunition, can you tell what uh, caliber and what brand of ammunition that is? 45 caliber. Okay. And is there also on the casing, a marking of the brand, or does it say? It's kind of hard to read. <coughs> you need glasses? Sidney does. <laughs> well, I'll just mark it in the middle. And, and it may be identified on the bag, Officer Swaggerty. Please will help you or hurt you, but you can try them.
in Officer Swaggart. If you can't read it, it's okay. We can. It's a no go on that. All right. And, and Your Honor, at this point, I will move the ammunition that's sealed in the evidence bag as the state's next exhibit. Exhibit five. Thank you. Officer Swaggart, next, I'd uh, ask you to identify this. Story. Is that you in the photograph? That's me. Is that you standing in uh, the defendant's hotel room? Yes. Okay. And is this the same photograph on the screen that you're holding in your hand? It is. And what are you doing in this photograph? Uh, taking ammo out of a purse. Okay. So this is a screen capture of someone's body cam. Right. And you're removing the ammunition from the defendant's purse. Yes. And that's the same ammunition that we just moved as Exhibit 5. Uh, and are you wearing some gloves at the time? Yeah. All right. And I'll move that photograph as the next exhibit, please. Exhibit six. Uh, Officer Swagger, you've testified that you uh, collected ammunition, uh, collected some marijuana. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, did you collect any needles? Yes. Like hypodermic needles? Right. Uh, and drug paraphernalia? Correct. Now, at some point in your interaction with the defendant, did you ask her for a photo identification? Yes. And did she provide you with a photo identification? Yes. All right. Yes. What is that? It's a variety of something. Okay. You're, you're actually holding the ID of the defendant in your hand. Right. And in just a moment, I'm going to ask you to see if it's the same on the screen, but we're having a technical glitch. Okay, Officer Swaggerty, is the photograph in your hand the same photograph that we see on the screen? Yes. And this is the defendant, Erica Castro Miles, photograph ID. Yes. Thank you. And I'll move that photograph as the next exhibit, please. Exhibit seven. Officer Swaggerty, can you identify this photograph? Yes. And is it the same photograph that we see on the screen? It is. And is that the defendant, Erica Castro Miles, with her photographic ID in her what appears to be right hand? Yes. All right. And I'll move that as the state's next exhibit. Exhibit eight. <clears throat> Did the defendant report to you that her vehicle had been stolen? Yes. Did you? observed or ask if the defendant had any injuries from the assault? Yes. And what did she say? She said the bruises was from uh, having sex with Mr. Boyfriend. Now. Okay. So when you ask about her injuries, she said she had some bruises, yes. but she told you they were caused from her having sex with her boyfriend? Yes. Did the defendant tell you where she had been the previous days before checking into the Midtown Inn and Suite? She was uh, in Vermont and came to Kentucky. So she said she went to Vermont and Kentucky. Correct. Okay. Uh, now, did you obtain arrest warrants that day for the uh, Stephen Wiggins? 
I do. And you entered those into a computer system, NCIC? I got dispatched to. Okay. And those arrest warrants, for, I guess, were for theft of a vehicle? Correct. And uh, aggravated domestic assault? Yes. So those warrants became active immediately for Stephen Wiggins? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, and finally, officer, did you issue some citations to uh, the defendant, Erica Castro Miles? Uh, yes. And uh, what were those citations for? Uh, possession of marijuana. Okay. And paraphernalia? Yes. And finally, Officer Swaggerty, can you identify these two documents, please? <laughs> It's the misdemeanor site. And that's the citation for possession and paraphernalia that was issued to Erica Castro Miles. Yeah. I'll move that to the next exhibit. Exhibit nine. And I'll pass the witness. Finley. Officer, as you testified, you encountered Miss Erica here on May the 29th, 2018. Yeah. Correct. Now, and then you took charges out for against Mr. Stephen Wiggins for aggravated domestic assault and the theft of her vehicle. Yeah. Okay. Now, those charges were never prosecuted to the best of your knowledge, were they? Mm -hmm. Best of your knowledge, they've not been prosecuted. Is that correct? I can't hardly hear you. Beg your pardon? I can't hardly hear you. Okay. To the best of your knowledge, the charges you took out against Mr. Wiggins for the aggravated assault of Miss Erica, that was never prosecuted, was it? I don't think so. You never went to court to testify about it, did you? No, I don't think so. Okay. And same with the theft of her vehicle. That's never been prosecuted to the best of your knowledge. Okay. Now, you met Erica and she told you what was going on in the hotel room. She'd gotten beat up a bit, right? Yes. She mentioned getting choked with a phone cord. Yes. She mentioned a gun being held to her head. Yeah. Okay. Now, she also mentioned she had to run out of the hotel room to get away from him completely naked. She told me that. He kicked her out of the room completely naked. Okay, now this is all, you didn't have body cam running at the time, did you? No. You had a, another a couple officers with body cam there. There's an officer, Mackin, who had some body cam going. Yeah. An officer, Go True. Is that, am I saying it right? Julio Go True. Julio. How, what, how do you say his last name? Julio. Julio is his first name, though, isn't it? I don't know. Okay, anyways. Call him Julio. All right. <laughs> Well, do you remember when she told you that she had to run out the hotel room naked, you kind of made fun of her? Do it. You made fun of her. You mocked her a little bit. No. She told you she was getting dressed, she was going to go get drinks. And before she could do that, Mr. Wiggins stripped her naked. And she had to run out of there naked. And you said, oh, so you ran out to go get the drinks naked? You don't remember saying anything like that to her? You remember saying she must like getting beat up? No, she said <clears throat> she was saying that the bruises and stuff was because of him, him having sex. And then it sounded like you liked it. She was smiling. She said, no, I don't like getting beat up. That's on the body cam, isn't it? Have you reviewed the body cam? No? And she reported that she's had multiple abusive partners in the past, correct? And that's when you said, you must like it. I don't recall that. You don't recall that. Well, we've been shown some photos here. Let me show you a few, too. If I may approach the witness. You may. Now, officer, the photo I just passed you is a still shot 
from Officer Mackin's body camera footage, right? Yes. And is that an accurate depiction <clears throat> of what the hotel room looked like when you entered it? Yes. And there's blood on the pillow. Do you see the blood on the pillow? Yes. Okay. I would like to publish this, but I'm not really sure the most effective means of doing that in this courtroom, Your Honor. Um, well, I, I mean, might uh, make it an exhibit and then publish. Right. My question is if uh, normally we'd run it through the electronic uh, screen, but if it's all you have is a still photograph, we'll pass it to the jury and allow them to exhibit. Thank allow you. Them to inspect it. Let's make it. If you will give that to the uh, clerk, please. And mark this the next exhibit in order, which should be 10. Yes, sir. Now, since I'm going to have to do this the old fashioned way, Judge, I have some more photos. I'd like to try and do them all. Let's yeah, get them in and do them all as quickly as we can. Now, likewise, Officer, are those accurate depictions of what the scene looked like? There's two of a hotel room that just show it's in disarray, correct? Yes. Okay. And then the other two are of Ms. Castro Miles. She appears to be looking at the bruising on her arm. And she also, in the next photo, she appears to be looking over her shoulder. Do you remember her looking over her shoulder every few <laughs> seconds when she sat on the stairs? I don't know who she's looking for. You don't know what she was looking for, but you did see her looking over her shoulder every few seconds, correct? That's not yet. And, and that's the only way in and out of the parking lot of that particular motel, right? Correct. Okay. Okay. I could make these next exhibits. You want to make them a collective exhibit? That's fine. <clears throat> What's their mark? We'll pass it to the jury. Do you have any other photographs? That's all I have photograph wise. If you want to, while she's marking those, you want to continue with your examination, then I'll pass. I'll have them demonstrated to the jury. Very well. <clears throat> now you've went to, you've been an officer for 26 years, you've said, correct? Yes. Okay. I assume you went to the Tennessee Law Enforcement Academy? Yes. And did you get trained on domestic violence while you were there? Yeah. Okay. And you were trained that victims return to abusers frequently, right? Uh, yeah. I'm sorry. You were trained that domestic violence victims frequently return to their abusers, correct? Sometimes. Sometimes. And you've arrested folks for domestic assault. Yeah. And it can get frustrating trying to prosecute those cases, can't it? No. Sometimes you ever you have difficulty prosecuting them because victims don't like to testify. No, no, I always got convicted. You've you've gotten convictions on every single one of your domestic assault cases. And I remember. Except for the one with Stephen Wiggins in it. Uh, I don't know if we got that or not. Well, you just said you got everyone, but you don't even know if he's been prosecuted. You got, but everybody else has been convicted, according to you, of your domestic assault arrest, right? Okay. Aggravated assault. Okay. Well, it's aggravated domestic assault, right? Right. Okay. Now, you also saw hair that had been pulled out of her head when it was in the hotel room. Is that fair? Yes. Okay. You had to calm her down when you first arrived on scene, didn't you? Yes. Couldn't understand what she was saying.
And at the end of your interaction with her, you considered arresting her for driving on a suspended license. Mm -hmm. You don't remember that? No. One second. Julio, right? That's what you called him? The other officer that was there with you? Yeah. Or one of the other ones? You don't remember going back around the back of the staircase and talking about, can we arrest her for driving on a suspended? Does that ring a bell to you? I did not arrest her. I know you didn't, but you talked about it, right? What? We discussed it. You discussed it, so now you remember. Okay, so you remember talking about arresting her for driving on a suspended, even though she'd been beaten, had her hair ripped out, and had a gun held to her head. I did not arrest her. You wanted to. I mean, <coughs> Ms. Finley, I have these marks. Do you want to pass them to the jury? Please. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, these photographs are, have been admitted into evidence and they're being passed to you. If you'll just take a moment to look at them for your consideration and pass them on to the next. It might be easier if you just look at the first one and then pass it on to the next, and then that way we can move it along a little quicker. Finley, are you going to have any other questions for this witness? I'm sorry, Judge. I would like to play Mr. Julio Gutro's body cam footage. 
but I believe the state's objecting to that coming in through this witness. I think it would be the most efficient way to do it, but. Well. And I don't have that on disc. I'd have to have a thumb drive. I, if it's the body cam from a different officer's footage, uh, body cam, it's footage from a different officer's body cam, then that officer would necessarily. So, so we have released Mr. Julio Gautreau from our subpoena, but if he wants to play it through Officer Swaggerty, that's fine. Right. Could you pull that up? <clears throat> might have it on. Don't <coughs> Yeah, I would like, Your Honor, if it please the court, I can burn a copy of that or put a thumb drive in evidence as a late filed exhibit. But I would, I can get that done tomorrow morning. Judge, we, we can take care of that for Mr. Finley. I mean, we'll play it and burn him a copy. And Give it to the court. Well, uh, the state's cooperating to allow you to play it and then make a copy of what they have there. So that shouldn't be a problem. Thank you. And for the record, this is the uh, <coughs> body cam footage off of the body cam of Officer Julio is the only name we've got identifying him. I've been pronouncing his last name as Go True. I don't know if that's uh wrong or right or yeah, misunderstood with Julio, what y'all call this guy? Yeah, I don't, but yes, your honor. It's, since it's on the body cam, you'll be able to spill we'll it. We'll be able to identify from the body cam language, but well, at least at this stage, we'll call him Julio until we find out what his real name is. I spent some time in Louisiana, so I thought it was a Cajun name or something like that, but really? Julio Gautreau. It is Julio Gautreau. I don't take him anywhere with us. We're not together 24 7. He's got four other girlfriends around here. <laughs> he was here when he was there. Yeah. I met him down there. When I got off the NSA, I met him Metro. at the gas station down there. Yeah. yeah. Whatever was down there, I don't. I don't stop anymore. I normally just keep going, but I they were all calling me screaming and yelling. And I just didn't want to deal with it last night. I had enough on my plate with my daughter being sick. And... No, this is the first time I've been here. Ever. Ever. Uh, whenever he's whenever we were done fooling around I wasn't looking at the clock oh, I don't have a phone so I, I'm not allowed to touch his phone so I don't know what time we got done fooling around when I was getting ready to go drinks and got stripped down to nothing to being to be the greatest. Like a he's in hot shit. You went out of here naked and did something. Right? No, I saw the door was open for me to get out so I could leave because it was threatening to shoot me in the head. So I ran out to save my own damn life with no clothes on. I didn't care. You met him yesterday. Down at Pedro's. I met him months ago up in Dixon. How did that all get in your book? Probably because he put it there. Because he likes to put his shit in everybody else's stuff. You could probably go through that bucket and find half of those clothes are probably his when his book is way over there. Probably find half of my clothes over there because for some reason he thinks, you know, 
I don't know what he did. He was down at that uh, gas station with all his clothes and stuff. No, there. mine were in the car. His were in the car. I towed him around because he doesn't have anywhere to live. So he stores his clothes in my car. But you just made it down there yesterday. Down at Payrolls, yes, but I, I live in Dixon and so does he. Don't make no sense. <clears throat> no, it don't. It don't make sense. We're both, we both live in Dixon. He lives on Yellow Creek. I live on Singleton. He doesn't live at home. You, he you're totes coming, his box you're, home. you're coming back to Vermont. Vermont and Radcliffe, Kentucky. And he knew we could stop at the Because home. I stopped and used the gas station phone to call him and tell him where to meet me. He wasn't there. Was he? he was at Pedro's gas station down the road waiting for me sitting on the curb. With all his clothes. No, his clothes were in the back seat of my car because I towed him around for him. Because I'm an idiot. Because I'm too nice of a damn person. Yeah. Four, three ex husbands that used to do the same goddamn shit to me, and I'm doing it again. No, I don't like it. Actually, no, I don't. I've tried to kill myself because I don't like it. I don't drive. He does. My partner well, was sitting down. I need. Story back. I drove to Vermont yes. because my daughter's having heart surgery yes. and dying. I'm not going to sit down here and not drive down there to see my kid. You was by yourself. To <laughs> yeah, I was by myself because I wanted to see my daughter who's in the hospital dying. So I would rather drive with no license to see my dying kid before she does pass away and at least see her one time before she's dead. I don't drive nowhere. Right back. What would you do? Take her day? I mean, the guy took her car yeah, without her permission. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, you can't let her license. Yeah, but he didn't see her driving. She said she does marijuana. We found marijuana in there. It's up to you. She don't charge her with it. It's up to you. I mean, what I would do is get warrants on him for the assault and taking her car. That's what I would do. If you want, you can write her a citation for the paraphernalia and whatever you want. Huh? Everything open up, baby. Over there. Well, I do not. Oh, well, one is yes, but I don't know if the RMS is, is working. But the one is, yeah, you can get a little o'clock, yeah. That's what I would do. I'm going to do. I think. 
It took the car without your permission, right? Is he allowed to drive your car? Only when I did it. <laughs> he had no license. Well, that's the first time I did it. Good. I saw a blue car on I'm a car with blue lights on Highway 7 in my way here. I'm like, what's going on? I don't know. Uh, I didn't stop because I was on my way. And how you treat all your domestic assault victims. What's the question? Is that how you treat all your domestic assault victims? Um, it might be different. No more questions. Good also, Swagger, the uh, domestic assault and theft charges against Stephen Wiggins are still open and pending. Is that correct? Yeah. So they haven't been dismissed. Did you observe any injuries on the defendant's neck from a cord, phone cord? No. No. But did you hear her say in the 911 call or to anybody that she had been strangled with a cord? I didn't hear that part. Okay. And you didn't observe any injuries around her neck? Only injury she says was on her having sex with her. Okay. Thank you. That's all. Three calls. I think based on that, you're Thank you all three. You may step down. You have another short witness. Yeah, the video through the next witness is 18 minutes, and then we'll have some questions. If it is, well, jury's lunch is here, so we'll go ahead and take a little early lunch and let them go ahead while the food's still hot. So. Um, Let's uh, reconvene at one o'clock. We'll be in recess for lunch until one o'clock. All rise. Doors in recess.
government to a fraction of frozen. Make one roll. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Off is fine. Um, Using this argument, I've been trying to sign orders that I haven't been able to get to for the last few days. Thank you, Judge. So Mr. Finley, if you need to get a copy of that order for some reason, uh, it'll be with the clerk as soon as I finish signing this last few. Thank you, Judge. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, is there anything before we bring the jury back? I think we have our juror that had the issue. Uh, I think we've got that resolved. They're on the phone to try to make sure that they've got what he needs. So we're ready to bring the jury in. Bring the jury in. Well, I think we have everyone here, so we're ready to proceed. Mr. Crouch, you may call your next witness. You want to stay calls Deputy Monica Mackin. <clears throat> Well, keep your witnesses up there at the jail or just they're they're in a secure place. <laughs> You will step right up here, please, ma'am, and uh, raise your right hand and be placed under oath. And officer, if you will please make sure you speak into that microphone. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, Deputy Mackin. Could you please say your name and spell your last name for the court reporter? Monica Mackin, M-A-C-K-I-N. And Deputy Mackin, um, you're clearly a law enforcement officer. How long have you been in law enforcement? Since 2008. And how long have you been with the Cheatham County Sheriff's Office? Since 2015. Um, do you remember, I'm going to ask you about a specific incident. Are you a patrol, on May the 29th, 2018, were you assigned to patrol? Yes. Um, at that time, what was your shift that you were assigned to? Uh, 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. Do you recall being... Uh, Dispatched out to 123 Lyman Hills Road in Kingston Springs yes. on May the 29th, 2018, about five minutes before the end of your shift. Yes. When you were dispatched out there to um, to the Midtown Inn and Suites, um, were there officers that were already there before you arrived? Yes. Um, do you recall which officers may have been there? 
Officer Swaggery. And what department does Officer Swaggery work? Cakes and Springs Police Department. So now in this situation, were you the primary officer or are you an assisting officer? I was an assisting officer. And at the time, did you have a body camera um, on your person? Yes. And is there a recording of your interactions of, yes. of that day? Do you see the screen there? Do you recognize what that is? That's my steering wheel of my patrol car. So is this you getting out at Alive in Hills Road? Yes. Okay. We could play that video, please. Morning. Our RMS is down, so we can't even check locals that he does have. The only thing they can check is, is the only thing they can check is NCIC and C. Do you think he took the gun with him? There's some weed in here too. It's a little bad. There's only one way into this place, and that's right through that right there. Thank <laughs> you. 
That worked. The weeds right here, too. So go over here, too. See that apple baggie over there? Put the weed in the floor. <laughs> I mean, there's a bunch of apple baggies. Look, that's why I put this on as I got in my pocket. As I got out, I put these on. There's apple baggies galore in there. Like big time out shit that hadn't come through yet. Like they're everywhere. Oh no! Look, there's. Four, five, six. There's like seven or eight on the floor. Then the, there's one over here with me. And one here. Yeah, her hair. Thing. It looks like he broke a ponytail too when he when he did it. The what? Yeah, I I didn't ask her because TC was asking questions whenever I. What's all in these baggies? What's in these baggies? I don't know. Come on, man. He probably had met I don't. I don't know what he was doing because we don't spend every waking moment together. I mean, half, half the time I'm in Vermont with my daughter because she's having heart through transplant surgeries. I've only been back here a couple of days. I just last night because I'm leaving my brother-in-law to call me to go get a U-Haul so I can get packed up and head on up to Illinois. How old's your daughter? She's 19. He carries a 45 because there's a round. That's got a picture. This is not something we can talk about. Miss Donna, we have that DL. Can we you send me a picture of the male subject and his DL for me? Would you let me put this full screen time brush there? Sorry? Sure. You don't have a cherry Hey. Simple. Yeah, the only thing I've gotten so far is the tag number. In her picture. What are we arguing over? He asked me to go to the store to buy a soda, so I got done doing fooling around. So I put clothes on to go, and then all of a sudden, he started freaking out and stripped me down to search me and put me in the corner, had me on the floor, tried to smother me with the pillow. I. He finally walked away and I saw a chance to get out and I just ran out. I didn't have any clothes on, I just ran out. How long have you been with this guy? A couple of weeks. Here's the weed piece here. There's a 45 caliber round too. And a gazillion apple babies. They're every damn like there ain't nothing No, I don't think they've ever been used. <laughs> and then you got the needles in the Ziploc bag. Yeah. Oh, yeah, there's a cap, there's a cap over here, too. But they picked up the needles and put them in that bag and took them upstairs. Took them to the office. So why aren't you staying in your house in Dixon? <clears throat> because I'm moving. So all my stuff is packed up. I'm moving to Illinois this week. Okay. But... So <laughs> why? Because still... I just keep got back into town from Vermont, and I stopped here to get a room so I can sleep instead of driving all the way to Dixon. Because I don't, I stay up there, but I don't stay up there. I go to Bowling Green a lot. I'm in Radcliffe, Kentucky, every Saturday and Sunday of every month to visit my youngest daughter. And every other Thursday, I'm in family therapy in Bowling Green. You feel better? Yes.
And staying in a hotel room is like a vacation for me to get away from all the drama up there. I have too much going on with my daughter having a heart plant, transplant and lung transplant and getting a divorce. And sometimes my ex-husband comes up there to harass me and I'd rather not be around because he's a, a drunk. Uh, I traded a Navy for a Marine for a felon for a drunk for a drughead. And they, I'll, I haven't had one relationship yet where I'm not on the floor. If you're watching her brush her hair, I'm not. I'm not sure that that's not from her brush. All the hair on the floor. <laughs> no, <laughs> she's brushing it. No, actually, he took his knife and tried to cut my hair off. Why did he put it in your hair? Probably because he put them there. He, put, he goes through my shit. I mean, literally, I you, had. You've been with this guy for two weeks? Yeah, and he totally just threw everything. I mean, Everything. She's out shampoo bottles and everything. Wasted everything. They'll take the tampons out and pull them apart. This is the way to go. Well, they they got the smart tops, yeah. the smart things. Yeah. There we go. So I cut them off. You're good. That's the tag. Do you me text that to you? That's the tag. So if you want for anything. And then I got his. Uh, she sent me his. Uh, she sent me his driver's license number too. Hang on. Hang on. I ain't ready yet. She's yeah. yeah. I I don't. My sister's a habitual drug user. I was trained about five days ago. Before that, I was clean for fourteen years. I'm trying to get to Illinois. My brother wanted. <laughs> Family. I smoke pot a lot of times to call my nurse and take sure. my medication doesn't work. And I don't have any terms to get my medication and I can't afford almost $400 for a prescription. I want to have to get your number. I mean, my husband was a mathematics. I said to save the image, but it didn't save for some stupid reason. So let's try this again. Oh no, I hit copy. Okay. I mean, that's my hit save. This guy. When they said the name, when he told me the name, it sounded familiar. She said he thought she thought he had warrants too, and I thought he was Yeah, yeah. yeah. so um, we couldn't check us. Yeah, we can tell the radio. So far, you kind of got nothing. All right, what was the phone number again? Uh, six four five two five four forty nine one eight. I'll send you his driver's license number too. I just sent those two pictures. Uh, 
All right, both pictures of his VM number system. Google said he would help, he would take over once we needed it. So he, had to, he ran to the shell station. <laughs> He said, Monica, I gotta go to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, have a good night or day. We'll see you in the 12 hours. <laughs> Yeah, I know. TC, we're out. Who else got your is your back cutter? <laughs> and are we tender the video as the next exhibit in this case? Seventeen eleven. Seventeen eleven. So, WD Mackin, that was an accurate depiction of your body camera that day, correct? And, and you left. Why did you leave? Uh, it was a little bit after six o'clock. Okay. Was it time for you to go? It was shift change. So, when Officer Julio got there, it, I was able to leave because he's a day shifter. Okay. So, you guys were basically swapping in for assisting Officer Swaggerty with Kingston's. Yes. So. Okay. Um, so the reason that you didn't stay until the end was because it's not your case and you were done for the day. Yes, ma'am. Um, you had some interactions with, with, uh, Ms. Castro Miles in here. Did you notice anything on her neck or any marks on her neck? No, ma'am. Um, and the Midtown Inn and Suites is in Cheatham County, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Pass the witness, Ryan. Good luck. <coughs> As we can see in the body cam footage, you entered the hotel room that Miss Erica was staying in, correct? Yes, sir. And we saw it was trashed. Yes. Sir. There was stuff everywhere. There's a, I think there was even a lampshade that looked like it had been knocked around a little bit, right? I don't remember. Oh, that's fine. Um, do you remember if the hotel phone had been broken? It, I don't remember at all. You notice it was off its hook, though, right? No. You didn't notice that? Okay. Now, I noticed you saw blood on the pillow, hair on the floor. Yes. And you thought originally it had been ripped out of her head and seen her brush it. You said, well, maybe she brushes like that on the regular, right? Correct. Okay. So not sure where the hair came from, but there was hair on the floor. Yes. Okay. And, I mean, it must have been a fair amount if you say it looked like he ripped her ponytail out. I and think I, possibly. I don't recall what exactly how much there was. Okay. Um, and obviously, Erica was upset when you got there. Yes. There's some bruising on her arms. I don't recall any seeing. And you found some. If I could actually just speak up a little bit or pull that microphone. There you go. Yes, sir. <clears throat> and I know you were asked about whether you saw any marks on her neck, and you say you don't recall any marks on her neck. Yes. Have you ever had a domestic violence victim tell you they were getting choked and you didn't see marks on their neck before? Yes. Okay. And you've been in law enforcement for quite a while, right? Yes. Oh, five, I think. Oh, eight. Oh, eight, excuse me. So since oh, eight, you've been in law enforcement, always in Tennessee? Yes. Okay. So you went to the Tennessee Law Enforcement Training Academy? Yes. And they teach you all sorts of things, you know, DUI enforcement. You have a bunch of classes on that in particular, correct? Yes. You can teach some of the science behind drinking. Right? Yes. And they also teach you a bit about domestic violence, right? Yes. Okay. Now, isn't it true that sometimes domestic violence cases can be difficult to prosecute? Yes. I mean, the victims run back to their abusers frequently, don't they? Some cases. In some cases. Um, and you're even trained on that, right? Yes. You're trained about this little cycle of abuse, right? Yes. Now, 
Now, Miss Erica told y'all she'd been held accountable, right? I don't recall her saying it while I was there. While you were there? Okay. You weren't there for the whole thing. No. Okay. But if she, she told you he was armed. Yes. That's all. Thank you, officer. You may step down. Let me call your next witness. State calls Jeremy Vaughn. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <clears throat> we state your full name, please. Uh, Jeremy Vaughn. Thank you. And we spell your last name. Uh, v a u g h a n. Thank you. And Mr. Vaughn, are you employed by the Kingston Springs Police Department? Yes, sir. And what's your position there? Uh, Sergeant. Okay. So, Sergeant Vaughn, how long have you been employed with Kingston Springs Police Department? Uh, 21 years. 21 years. Uh, are you a shift supervisor? or uh, well, tell, me, tell us what your duties as sergeant entail. Uh, yeah, so we're a small department. I'm the only sergeant, um, the one that holds rank there. Um, so, yeah, part of my duty is to follow up on investigations and things like that. So, just to put in context for the jury, when you say you're a small department, how, how many... Uh, officers work for the Kingston Springs Police Department? Seven. Seven. And do you all run uh, a shift 24-7 or just certain hours during the day? Uh, no, sir. We have, we have a gap from 2 a.m. to 4 a.m. Okay. And on regular working hours, do other agencies sometimes come in to assist, such as the Cheatham County Sheriff's Department? Yes, sir. Okay. And specifically, I'm referring to uh, May 29th of two, 2018 at about 6 o'clock a.m., it, would it be common for the Cheatham County Sheriff's Department to assist on a call? Yes, sir. All right. Now, <clears throat> Sergeant Vaughn, uh, did you work this incident at the Midtown Inn and Suites uh, on May 29th of 2018? No, sir. You had no part in the investigation of this case? <laughs> Correct. Uh, however, did you collect some video from the Midtown Inn and Suites? Yes, sir, I did. And is it uh, common or actually frequent for you to go to the businesses in Kingston Springs and collect, extract uh, DVD and, and photographic evidence. Yes, sir. Why, why are you doing that for businesses in Kingston <clears throat> Springs? As, I guess, in your position as a police officer, correct? Yes, sir. All right. Um, most, honestly, most business owners don't know how to operate the camera systems. Okay. So they call you? Yes. <laughs> so if there's been an incident or a crime reported at a business in Kingston Springs, uh, it's common that you would be called to extract the, the information or the video? Yes, sir. Okay. And did you do that in this case? I did. And did you collect a series of videos from different cameras at the Midtown Inn and Suites? Yes, sir. All right. And can you identify this, please? <clears throat> yeah, this is a uh, DVD copy from the surveillance video uh, showing uh, Miss Miles checking into the hotel room. Okay, and, and is there a one circled in the corner? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, sir, there is. And it's checking in? Correct, checking into Midtown. Okay, play the video, please. <clears throat>
Okay, Sergeant Vaughn, uh, from watching the video, uh, first, did you observe uh, how the defendant exited the vehicle? Uh, yes, sir. Was it from the driver or passenger side? Uh, the front passenger door. Front passenger door. And did you observe uh, her provide some type of identification or something to the clerk here? Uh, yes, sir. She provides uh, some type of photo identification. Okay. And then when she leaves the hotel office, did you observe which door she uh, entered as far as getting back into the car. Yeah, she entered the same door, the front passenger door. Front passenger door, okay. And I note on the video, it says uh, May 28th, 2018, 9.42 p.m. Is it, do you know if those times are accurate or not? I, I do not know. Um, okay. I do find that most cameras are, are off. Off by, is this off by hours or minutes? Or? Um, this particular one, I'm, I'm not sure. Okay, and I will move that video as the next exhibit, please. Thirteen. Thirteen. Thank you. Uh, yes, sir. This video, this uh, DVD copy, is titled uh, "Erica Castro Miles Runs Out of Midtown." Um, Thank you. That's the number two in the top corner. Number two. And and before we start, uh, what's the date and time? Uh, the date says May 29th. 2018 at 5.49 a.m. Okay, so the following morning? Correct. I'll move that video as exhibit 14. 14. Sergeant Block, can you identify this video? Uh, yes, sir. This is a DVD copy um, titled Stephen Wiggins Leaving Midtown for the First Time. Uh, it's labeled number three in the top corner. Okay. And what's the date and time? Uh, May 29th, 2018 at 5.52 a.m. Pause right there. Hey, Sergeant Vaughn, does this person successfully open the driver's side door? Uh, yes, sir. Okay, go ahead. Pause it right there. Sergeant Vaughn, I know some distance and this is kind of grainy, but uh, can you see some type of object here on the hip? Uh, yes, sir. Um, on Mr. Wiggins' right hip, there appears to be a uh, black handgun sticking out of his pants. Thank you.
Move that in States Exhibit 15, please. 15. Yes, sir. This uh, DVD copy is titled Stephen Wiggins Returning to Midtown. Uh, and it has a number four on the top right corner. Thank you. Pause it right there. And can you identify the date and time? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, May 29th, 2018 at 7.53 a.m. Right there. All right, Sergeant Vaughn, can you describe what we're seeing in the video now? Uh, this particular camera is capturing the guest parking lot um, at the Midtown Inn and Suites in Kingston Springs. Um, the, the motel is just this one building on the right side with the uh, first and second floor. Um, you can see uh, that was Mr. Wiggins that pulled back into the parking lot. In this video, does he appear to be wearing a shirt? Yes, sir, he does. Standing the door. Correct. Is this a window next to the door? Yes, sir, it is. You see the window curtain move? Yes, sir. There? Yes, sir. Does, does the window curtain appear to be open now? It does. Uh, Mr. Williams entered the hotel room. Yes, sir, he does. Put that as the next exhibit, please. 16. So, the ball can you identify this? Uh, yes, sir, this uh, video is titled, titled Stephen Wiggins uh, speaking with uh, Miss Lear uh, bon, Bonsinger. Yeah, and, and do you know Miss Bonsinger? Uh, I did when she, uh, before she passed away. She was an employee at Midtown Inn. She was the an employee and a manager at Midtown Inn? Yes, sir. Okay. She has recently passed away or within the last six months or so? Yes, sir. Uh, and what's the date and time? Uh, May 29th, 2018, 7.58 a.m. Pause it right there. And can you describe what's happening in the video at this point? Uh, right there, you can see um, Mr. Wiggins exiting the room, turning right, going back towards where he parked the vehicle. Thank you. And is that Miss Bunting your? Uh, yes, sir, it is. Okay. She appeared to stop near or at the entrance to that room? I'm sorry. Did she stop walking near or at the entrance to that hotel room? Yes, sir. She stops and looks into the room. Okay. Is that Miss Bonsignor that we see walking back towards the hotel office? Yes, sir, it is. Um, 
That is the state's next exhibit, please. 17. Can you identify this? Yes, sir. This uh, DVD is titled Wiggins and Castro Miles Leaving Midtown. Okay. Can you identify the date and time? Uh, May 29th, 2018 at 8.01 a.m. That is the state's necessary. And <clears throat> Sergeant Vaughn, in your employment history with the Kingston Springs Police Department, how many times have you been to uh, Midtown Inn and Suites? Uh, hundreds. Hundreds? Yes, sir. Have you had occasion to go into any of the rooms at the Midtown Inn and Suites? Multiple times. And are all of those rooms uh, contain a, a landline phone? Yes, sir, they do. I'll pass the witness. Good afternoon, Sergeant. Good afternoon. Now, you got all the videos that from the Kingston Springs or Midtown Inn or whatever the hotel's called? Yes, sir, I, I retrieved them from the hard drive. You also got one of Miss Erica going into the lobby. Yes, sir. You recall that? Yes, sir. And she, stark naked. Yes, sir. Hotel clerk had to cover her up. I'll have some stills on the past to you just one moment. Okay. Now approach a witness, Your Honor. Now, if you could please look at those and tell me if those look like accurate uh, screenshots or screen grabs or whatever they're called of bits of the video that had Miss Miss Erica in the hotel lobby. Yes, sir. They they do appear to be screenshots from the uh, the video player. I'd like to make this next exhibit collective, please. Oh, it'd be a collective, collective exhibit 19. <coughs> I think I have them chronological, Sergeant. But um, on the first one, it has Miss Erica being covered up. Well, whenever you're ready, Madam Clerk. On the first one, she was being covered up by Miss. I'm sorry, say her name for me. Uh, Lear uh, bon, Bonjour. 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 Okay. Miss Lear. Miss Lear was covering up Miss Erica, right? Yes, with a towel. That was the first photo. And then there's just one of Erica kind of straw over her face. I, I guess I could wait. Yeah, wait. I'm sorry. Can I, can I look at the photos as you go along? Yeah. You're on the second photo? Yes, sir. Okay. And then another one well, looks like a, again helping her get covered up there. <laughs> and then we have just Miss Erica crying, right? Yes, sir. Papers not cooperating with me for the next one. Now it looks like Miss Lear is calling the law. Well, she's calling somebody at least, right? Yes, sir. She's on the phone. Okay. And then another one just her looks like checking Erica over. So I'd like whenever. The court, Madam Clerk, is ready to publish those to the jury. Uh, so you got a fair amount of footage. In the footage I reviewed, I did not see any video of Miss Erica leaving the hotel. I mean, I saw the car depart, but I didn't see her walking to the car. Did you ever retrieve that? Uh, yes, sir. The, the video where uh, Mr. Wiggins returns to the hotel yes, sir. Um, goes into the room, and then there's a video I've recovered that shows uh, Mr. Wiggins and his miles. <coughs> Exiting the room, hearing things to load the vehicle. Okay, I must have missed that. So there, there was some footage of that. Yes, sir.
And how long have you been in law enforcement? Uh, 21 years. 21 years. All at Kingston Springs? Yes, sir. And uh, you're a ship supervisor, is that right? Or Yes, sir. Okay. So a lot of officers are under you. Well, there's 70 all total. How many are under you? Uh, five. Five of them. <clears throat> so it goes chief, captain, sergeant, I assume? Right? Uh, no, it'd be uh, chief and then sergeant. That's all. Okay. Now, you went to the Tennessee Law Enforcement Training Academy as well? Yes, sir, I did. Okay. And they taught you about domestic violence? Yes, sir. And they taught you that abuse victims frequently go back to their abusers? Yes. Okay. And there's a whole cycle of abuse. You get taught about that a little bit too, right? Yes, sir. And it's difficult for these victims to walk away sometimes, isn't it? Sometimes, yes. Now, when you identified a firearm on Mr. Wiggins' hip, he had the, the hood of the vehicle popped and had it up. Yes, sir. He was fooling with what I assume was the fuse box. Could you tell what he was fooling with? I could not. That's where a fuse box is normally, though, what he was tinkering with in it. It's about the same location. Uh, I'm not familiar with that vehicle. Okay. That's all I have. Reader, right? No questions. Thank you. I'll show you this. Now that you are released, enter. You may call your next witness. Uh, you call Colleen Lewis. Right up here, please, ma'am. Raise your right hand and face our clerk. Good afternoon, Ms. Lewis. Hey. Hi. Could you please say your name um, for the court and spell your last name for the court reporter? Um, Colleen Lewis, L E W I S. And Ms. Lewis, how are you currently employed? Um, I work for Walmart for asset protection. And how long have you been in asset protection? Um, 15 years. And could you just briefly describe for the jury what asset protection means at Walmart? Um, we handle like all of the theft within the store, safety issues, um, anything that happens outside the store that may assist law enforcement. So is part of your job to review video when requested by law enforcement? Yes. Um, and is that something that you do all the time? Yes. In the natural course of your employment. Mm -hmm. Does Walmart have a lot of cameras in it? We do. Um, and you have a lot of video, correct? Yes. Um, and what Walmart specifically are you assigned to? Um, the Dixon Walmart. Is that at 175 Beasley Road? Yes. Were you asked to retrieve some videos from May the 29th of 2018? Yes. Okay. You can play the country one. Put it up there. I'll see you. Ms. Lewis, do you recognize what view of a camera this is? Yes. What is it? I believe it's the uh, grocery entrance. I so said it says grocery three down at the bottom, correct? Mm -hmm. um, I guess. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Can you not see around the monitor? I can't. Remember. Okay. Um, and does it have a date and a time down mm -hmm. at the bottom? Can it, you see that? It does. It says May 29th. I can't see the time though. You can't see the time on that. Okay. Um, 
Okay. Now the videos that we're going to watch, there's several of them. You've seen them, correct? Yes. Okay. They're all about this, the same same time frame, different camera angles. All right. So we're going to play the first video, please. Do, do you recognize that specific individual? Yes. Who is it? It's Stephen Wiggins. Okay. You know, I move uh, the Walmart Grocery Three video as the state's next exhibit. What? <clears throat> I'll be looking at the entrance of grocery, I believe. Um, Ms. Lewis, do you recognize where that is? Yes. Where is that in relation to the store? That is, um, that's an angle from the actual grocery aisles to the front door on the grocery okay. side. So is it the same, I say the same area that we saw in the previous video, but just farther away? Yes. Okay, you can play that please. And again, is that Mr. the same individual you've already identified as Mr. Wiggins? Yes. We'll move a copy of this video as next exhibit, exhibit number 21. Ms. Lewis, are the times and the dates accurate on these videos? Yes. Now I believe we're looking at the stand grocery seven. Uh, where is this video? Is this behind the cameras that we've seen before? So that is actually a door camera okay. pointing in the opposite direction from the one we just watched. Okay, but it's still in the same vicinity there, just to remember. Um, there's an individual in a tank top, like mm -hmm. an orangey colored tank top there. Do you know that person? I do. Who is that? It's Veronica Pilcher. And have you had previous experiences with her? Is that how you know yes. her? Yes. Okay. You can play that, please. <coughs> We have a copy of this video as the state's exhibit number 22. Now I'm looking at the Walmart AA front back. Um, where is this camera located? So that is the main aisle coming in the front grocery doors going down to like the, uh, where the dairy coolers and stuff are at the very back of the store <coughs> on the grocery side. So the first three videos that we saw were up front by the front doors. And then we saw Mr. Williams come up, meet Ms. Pilcher. And then is this going to be continuing down the same lane of travel? Yes. Okay. <coughs> and, and they're going to turn in a minute there. I'll ask you, what section are they headed towards? That is the menswear area. To the section where they just walked over into the aisles mm -hmm. there and they, it looks like they stopped. Is that the menswear? It is. Mr. Ethridge, can you pause that for a second? Right, do you see the two individuals that just went into the men's department coming back out? Yes. No. Okay. And it's at That was Mr. Wiggins and Ms. Pilcher walking back down towards the doors, correct? Correct. Can I move this video as state's exhibit number 23, please? Now we're looking at, looks like uh, Stan Grocery 7, second clip. And this is the same camera view that we'd seen earlier, but <coughs> earlier it's 953. Yes. Okay.
And again, that was Mr. Wiggins and Ms. Pilcher walking down, but Mr. Wiggins exit and Ms. Pilcher goes to a different part. The store Correct. Um, did you see them use the checkout at this point? They just went in and came right back they out. They just went in and came back out. All right, move this to state's exhibit number 24. I think we have one last video. Number five. And where is this camera located? That is in the grocery door, just on the opposite side from the very first one we saw. Okay. So this is like the, the outside sort of credit card area um, between the two security doors, right? right. Okay. <coughs> And that would be Stephen Wiggins leaving the Walmart. Correct. Right. And we would make this the state's exhibit number 25, please. We'll pass the witness. Any questions, Mr. No, sir. Thank you, ma'am. You may step down and you will release. Call your next witness. <clears throat> Let's step right up here, sir. Place our clerk and raise your right hand. We solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give in this case to be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so I hope you got it. Good afternoon, Mr. McClanahan. Good afternoon. Could you please say your entire name and spell your last name for the court reporter? Kenny McClenahan, M-C-C-L-E-N-A-H-A-N. And Mr. McClenahan, where are you currently employed? Speedway. And how long have you been employed at Speedway? For four years. Four years. Um, and what is your job duty, what is your job title at Speedway now? I am the store leader. The store leader. So you're in charge of everything. And where is your store located? 506 Highway 46 South in Dixon. And that's Dixon County in Dick, the city of Dixie. Tennessee, 37055. Sorry, right, thank you. Now, Mr. McClanahan, does your store have surveillance video? Yes, ma'am. Does it have a lot of cameras? Yes. <laughs> Do those cameras record pretty much everything that happens? Yes, ma'am. Um, in May of 20, on May 29th, 2018, were you employed in the Speedway yes, in Dixon? And how were you employed then? <laughs> okay. And Part of your duties as the assistant manager, did you have to go review surveillance videos? Yes, ma'am. And do you understand how the surveillance system works? Yes, ma'am. And do, are you the one who gets to burn the videos when yes, requested? Okay. And we're specifically here today about something that happened on May the 29th, 2018. Um, have you seen those videos? Yes. Okay. If you could please um, play the Speedway entering video. Mr. McClanahan, do you recognize where that camera angle is? Yes, that shows the first 10 pumps, which are to the left of my front. Okay. Um, and is this part of your, I mean, this, the, I see the screen capture, the screen video here. Is that what your surveillance playback system looks like? Yes. And there's a date and time down at the bottom there. Uh, I don't know if you can see that over the play button. Yes, it says it's five, uh, the 29th on 10 o'clock. Okay. If you could play that, please, Mr. Etheridge. And we're focusing on the two cars, the brown car and the red car.
Now, the direction that the driver of the, the brown colored car there was walking, was that towards the doors? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And I'll make the Speedway video the next exhibit, please. Exhibit 26. Yeah, if I could approach the witness, Your Honor. Right. Mr. McClanahan, do you recognize what that is? Yes, ma'am. And is that a screen capture of a video from inside the store? Yes, ma'am. This is the second POS of my registers. Okay, and is there a date and time down at the bottom there? Yeah, 1005 on the 29th of May, okay. 2018. Okay, and do you know that individual? At the time, I did not, but I do now. Okay, who do you know it to be now? That is Stephen Wiggins. All right, and I'll move the photo as the next state's exhibit. I believe that's going to be 27. 27. <coughs> And then if I could play the Speedway exit, please. I'll put that up and we'll talk about that. Mr. McClanahan, again, do you recognize um, where that video is? Yes, ma'am. Like this is the pumps that are to the left of my front door. Okay. And do you see a date and time down at the bottom? Uh, okay. So May, May 29, 2018 at 10.06. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> And is that the same individual, Mr. Wiggins, that you saw in the, the still photo going up back to that car? Yes, ma'am. He's getting in. Well. And he just got into the driver's side, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. All right. The state will move. This is, I believe, exhibit number 28, please. Okay. And we'll pass the witness on. Any questions? Thank you, sir. You may step down and you will release from your subpoena. They may call your next witness. Today calls Darlene Rep. If you will step right up here, please, ma'am, and place our court. He's going to swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give in this case to me, Mr. Lowtree. Nothing but the truth, so happy. You have a seat, please. And when you testify, speak into that microphone. Okay. Good afternoon. Hi. Uh, will you uh, state your full name, please? Darlene Rep. And spell your last name. R-E-P-P. -P. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Rupp, you are currently a resident of Dixon County, is that correct? Yes. And previously, you lived, I think, in California? Yes. What year did you move to Dixon County? 2012. 2012. Uh, at some point, did uh, you come to know uh, Ms. Erica Castro-Miles, the, the defendant in this case? Yes. Uh, 
is it fair to say that you became friends with her? <coughs> this is kind of difficult for you to testify today. Yes. Yeah. Well, I'll keep it as brief as possible. <clears throat> I know she keep making. I love her. Yeah. You, you love her. I mean, that's that's a fair assessment, right? Yes. Yeah, are you concerned about her? Yes. All right. So, um, Ms. Rupp, let me back you up to May of 2018. Okay. Uh, do you remember in the beginning of May where the defendant uh, was living? She had been living in a um, at a lady's house in a, a trailer behind her house. Okay. Mm -hmm. And do you know what the name of that road was? Single Singleton or something like that. Singleton Road. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And prior to that, did she live uh, in a different location in Dixon County? Van Leer. Van Leer. Uh, so she lived in, when she was living in Van Leer, was it a, a, a house, an apartment? An apartment. An apartment. Mm -hmm. So at some point she moved from an apartment in Van Leer over to Singleton Road. Yes. How did you become acquaintances and friends with the defendant? Uh, I was offering to help her um, spay and neuter her animals, okay. her dogs. She's a dog lover. And so are you. Mm -hmm. yes. In fact, that's your business, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> Ms. Rupp, do you remember when you became friends with her? Um, let's see. Um, maybe 2013 or 14. Okay. So you knew her for quite a few years a after you moved to Tennessee. Yes. And now, was she also from California? Yes. How did you, did you know that or know her in California? No, no um, as I talked to her, um, I mentioned I was from California and she said, yes, she was from California also. Okay. Now, in May of 2018, was the defendant married to a man by the name of John Miles? In May of, yes. Mm -hmm. Did, did yes. you ever meet Mr. Miles? Yes. Okay. Was he also living with the defendant in the trailer on Singleton Road? I'm not sure about that. I don't know. Where did, did you ever see Mr. Miles in Dixon County? Yes. Where would you see him? Um, <coughs> with, with Erica in a car. Or, okay. Um, picking up her daughter. Okay. Like so in May of 2018, she was married to John <coughs> Miles. Yes. Now let's, let's talk briefly, sidetrack to uh, children. Did the defendant have children or does she have children? Yes. And, and do you remember their names? Tiffany. Right. My mind just went. That's Brayden, fine. Brayden and Veronica. And, and yes. you, knew, you knew one of them better than the others. Yes, Tiffany. Tiffany. Mm -hmm. Why did you know Tiffany better than the others? Um, Tiffany, I saw, she's in... Uh, teenager in high school and uh, I worked night shift and I asked her if she wanted to work babysitting my children at night. Okay. Uh, and, and that was back in 2018? Yes. All right. Has uh, Tiffany since graduated no, from high school? No, um, it was in 2018. She, I took her to the airport when she, when she graduated to fly back to North Carolina. So um, I don't know when she graduated, maybe it was 2016 or 17. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm going to refer you back to 2018. Did, okay. Did you have any interaction with Tiffany in 2018? Just text messages, checking in. Okay. Yeah. And then prior to that is when Tiffany lived kind of on and off at your house. Yes. Mm -hmm. Did she actually have a residence at your house, Tiffany? She um, stayed there pretty much all the time because I worked all the time. Sure. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Now we'll scoot forward again to May of 2018. Okay. Uh, at some point, uh, you had, I think it was May the 20th or so of 2018, did you run into the defendant, Erica Castro Miles? Yes. And, and did you make some observations about her? Your Honor, yeah. may we approach? Yes. You want this on the record? Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> if you would please step out across the hall.
Your Honor, I hate to guess at what General Crouch's next question was going to be, but I believe it was, was she used on drugs or did she appear to be under the influence or something like that? I think that's just prejudicial. It's not relevant to what we're doing here today. I think it requires a jury out before we get into things like that anyway. So this is a preemptory objection to a question that has not yet been answered, but you anticipated uh, what the question may be. Uh, tell me if I'm wrong. No, I'm, I'm not going to tell you anything. <laughs> I'm just uh, going to listen to General Crouch ask the question, and then we'll go from there, General. Well, Judge, Mr. Finley's correct, but I don't think it was a guess because it's literally directly from Ms. Rep's statement, which was provided to Mr. Finley. But yes, next question is going to be about her interactions uh, with uh, the defendant for two bases. Uh, one, uh, the defendant describes her relationship with Stephen Wiggins. Uh, so that has nothing to do with drugs or alcohol. But two, uh, Ms. Rupp will describe that uh, she believed that the defendant had relapsed and was again using drugs, which the state believes is relevant in this case because as Mr. Finley has been doing with every witness, he's pointing out that this incident in Kingston Springs was caused by domestic abuse, but at the heart of it is methamphetamine use. So it is very relevant. Well, I have no doubt that Mr. Wiggins was using methamphetamine, but there's been no proof that I'm aware of. The podium, I think it would help us to make sure that we can hear. It. Apologize. All right. I'm aware of no proof that's been put before the court that Ms. Erica Castro Miles was using any sort of methamphetamine. Now, Mr. Wiggins was for sure. I mean, he was, there, I won't get into all that other stuff that's been excluded, but I don't doubt that Mr. Wiggins was on it. Ms. Erica, I don't think there's been proof provided to the court that she was. We haven't addressed that in any 404B hearings prior. Um, I just, I don't see how it's relevant. It's absolutely prejudicial cast her in a very negative light, but it doesn't, it's not probative to any fact. And really, regardless of whether she was or wasn't on methamphetamine, she was still beaten up. She still had a gun held to her head. We had blood on a pillow. There's already been inter evidence introduced about marijuana. That's made her look bad enough. I think we can cut that off there. I don't think that needs to be, be brought in. Now, the comments about how in love she was with Mr. Wiggins, I expect that to be admissible, Judge. Just not the perceived perception of, of a lay witness that she was under the influence of methamphetamine or, or whatever she was under the influence of. <clears throat> Judge, actually the proof in the case to this point has been from three separate officers or two that uh, they didn't observe these injuries on Ms. Castro Miles. The only injuries that observed were some bruising on her arm, which she tells them are for having sex and intercourse with Mr. Wiggins. Second, uh, you can hear Ms. Wiggins talking about methamphetamine on the body cam video. Now, she attributes this to Stephen Wiggins, but that's part of the state's case is that she attributes every single action that occurs to Stephen Wiggins. And why wouldn't you? I mean, once you're in trouble, it's easy to blame somebody else. But in this particular case, we have proof introduced through testimony and body cam of needles that were collected of eight, I think, apple baggies that were described by Officer Mankin and the collection of marijuana. So there's, I mean, the jury's, I mean, this is a case about methamphetamine. We just watched a drug deal on a Walmart body cam. So it is very relevant. Well, the court is required to balance the... Uh probative value of the evidence versus any prejudicial effect. And clearly, um, the evidence that's already been introduced in this case is the evidence of uh, the hotel room that uh, officers' body cam footage was there. And particularly, uh, Officer Mackin, I think it was, uh, that testified, the sheriff's deputy, uh, Mackin, that testified. And she denoted a number of baggies laying there that appeared to have uh, drugs in them. and. I did uh, understand that there was statements that Mr. Wiggins was supposedly on methamphetamines that was made during the body cam footage. In any result, in any event, rather, um, 
clearly there's evidence of drug use in that hotel room. Um, the behavior of Ms. Castro Miles in that particular instance and her going back with Mr. Uh, Wiggins apparently after that is a subject that both sides will be able to argue to the jury as to why she did it or why she didn't do it. Uh, if she was the victim of domestic abuse and was forced back into it, or if the state's theory is that it was all drug-related activity. Uh, the testimony of this witness regarding her observations of Ms. Castro Miles at the time would be her perception as to whether or not uh, she had relapsed. Um, and I think it would be relevant and therefore it would outweigh any prejudice since there is already ample evidence in this record uh, of the uh, drug use that was involved and when she was in the car, uh, apparently with Mr. Wiggins, when she checked into the motel and the video shows that there was, she was not the driver and there was someone else driving and then they check into the hotel and he is in and out of the motel room on a regular basis. And then when you go into the motel room on the body cam footage, it clearly shows ample drug use everywhere. Um, that it seems to me that, that that evidence is already before the jury and that this would be simply um, that, that the probative value of it is certainly would outweigh any prejudice to the defendant, which I think the prejudice has already been shown by the drug use that's clearly evident from the hotel room. So I uh, overrule the objection and allow the uh, evidence to come in, but I will limit it to simply just the questions regarding her observations of her and what she perceived as being, uh, whether or not she had, I assume she has some basis for having that observation. Anything then before we bring the jury back? We note the objection. I note the objection of the defendant and overrule it. We are ready for the jury. Judge, just for time reference, what, what time are we supposed to stop? Well, we're not stopping for the day. We're, uh, we're just going to elongate a little bit our uh, afternoon recess. And it was supposed to be around 3 o'clock, but I'm not sure. It's uh, I'm at their mercy, so we'll hopefully do that. I apologize for having agreed to do that. I'm just trying to orchestrate witnesses in a timely way. <laughs> If we are at a point where we're not ready to stop, then I'll have to wait on me if they need to. All right, if we've got everyone back, you may proceed. Okay, Ms. Rubb, uh, we were discussing an interaction that you have with the defendant about three weeks before the murder of Sergeant Daniel Baker, okay? Now, let me back up just a little bit though. Uh, did you used to be an alcoholic or a drug user? I'm in recovery, yes. Yeah. And how long have you been in recovery? 23 years. 23 years. That's a significant amount of time, is that right? Uh, did, did you discuss sobriety and uh, yes. the use of drugs with the defendant on yes. occasion? Now, going back to your observations of her in May, mid-May or so, uh, what did you observe? She had, she had six years of sobriety, and uh, I hadn't talked to her for a little while. And when I started at the gas station, I um, was concerned for her welfare. She, she didn't look good, and she wouldn't look me in the eye. And, uh, I asked her if she was okay. She said, um, I just worked a double shift at donut shop, I think is where she was working. And uh, she was she was fine. And did you say something to her either by uh, phone or text about her sobriety? Yes. What, what did you say? What she said to me. So I, I just wanted her to know that I was there to help her if she needed help and when she was ready to. Uh, get help, I would be there for her. Uh, what? And, uh, 
saying you're gonna lose your house, you're gonna lose your dogs, you're gonna lose your kids, let me help you. And she said, um, I've been, I slipped up, but I've been clean for a couple of weeks now. Okay. And I'm fine, I'm doing it. <coughs> Good, thank you. Now, <clears throat> you also uh, had some interaction or comment with her about her new boyfriend, is that correct? Yes. And what did she state about uh, Mr. Stephen Wiggins? He was a... And would you like to read your statement so you could refresh your memory? Sure. May I approach the witness, Sean? You may. He was... Um... Hang on one second. Okay. So I have to let you read it first. And, okay. And then if you can testify right. from memory without that. Okay. Um, she, she told me that she had separated from her husband and they were getting a divorce. And she met a man that was treating her right. And um, he was home. He was everything. And, um, she finally met someone. It was wild. Okay. So she told you that she had met a man that treated her right. Yeah. Uh, did she also tell you that uh, the new guy was electrifying? Electrifying, yes. Is that the word she used? Yes, that's what she said. She said he was electrifying? Electrifying. Oh. Mm -hmm. Did she also say that he was wanted by law enforcement? That was her only hang up. That he was, she said, we just have one problem in. He's wanted by the law. Okay. Thank you. I'll pass the witness. Really? Good afternoon. My name is Jake Finley. I'm representing Miss Erica Castro Miles. You testified for her before, didn't you? Yes. At a bond hearing, right? Yes. Now, at that hearing, you testified that you rescued dogs with Erica. Mm -hmm. Is that how y'all got to know each other? Yes. And you knew her, I guess, since 2012, 2013, around about then? Um, 13 or 14, something like that. Now, you hadn't seen her in how long was, did it, was it? How long of a break did y'all have before you ran into her back in May of 2018? A couple months. Just months? Mm -hmm. Okay. And she had been with her husband at the time. His name was Miles, John Miles. Yes. Is that right? Mm -hmm. So they split up. Yes. He was not treating her right. No, I saw her frequently with black eyes, bruising, bruising arms, bruises on her chest. And, and this is presumably from Mr. Miles. Well, I asked her kids about it, and they told me about the situations, but... Um, she thought that if she just acted a certain way or, no, I don't think, you know, that she thought that she, if she acted a certain way or um, stayed on, he stayed off alcohol, that things would work out with them. She kept trying. How long did she keep trying? Years. Years. Mm -hmm. She went back after every time she got beat up by Mr. Miles yes. for years. Yeah. What is she tried to separate from him, but... So, the whole time you knew Erica, I believe you described her as gentle. Yes. Loving. Yes. Kind. Mm -hmm. Very much so. Now, when you yeah. saw her back in May, she didn't look right. No. Was she in another abusive situation? I don't know. Direction? Also for speculation. Same. Did you notice any bruising? <coughs> no. You saw her just briefly. Yes. The rest of your communication was over a text message. Yes. Mm -hmm. So you, for all you know, somebody else was on her phone texting. You don't know. It's, it's okay. Now, did you ever meet Stephen Wiggins? No. When you saw her, I'm sorry, where were y'all? At the gas station in Van Leer. Okay. And Van Leer, where's Van Leer? I, don't, I, I feel like I should know between, that. Between 
Dixon and uh, Clarksville. It's a little town. Okay. Population 300 probably. Okay. Um, so when you see her at this gas station of Van Leer, was she driving or did you notice? She was pumping gas at her, in her car. Okay, so it was just her. Actually, she was kind of in her car fiddling around and she just had pump gas. So okay. she was going through her purse or something. I don't know. But she was along the best you could tell. Yeah. And I'm sorry, what day was this? May 20th? Around about that time. Yes, anyways. I texted her the next day. Okay. Mm -hmm. And she, you know, whether it was her or whether it was somebody else, whoever was texting you, they were excited about this new person. When you first met her um, back in 2012, was she already married to Mr. Miles? I didn't, I don't, I don't think so. I think she had an on and off relationship with him. Was she ever excited about him? I don't think so. Not that you can remember um, anyways? Okay. Fair yeah, maybe so. Yeah. Sometimes, maybe not. Highs and lows, right? Yeah. Did she ever confide in you? Did Erica ever confide in you that, um, about any abuse from Mr. Wiggins? No. Okay. But you weren't really in contact with her during the time period she was with him, it sounds like, right? And I think um, prior to her, it doesn't really matter. I just surmise that she had a lot of pride about whether she was going to say anything or not. She didn't always tell you if she was suffering. Right. Was, okay. That's it. Suffering in silence. Right. She did that a lot. One second. Did Miss Erica ever confide in you about relationships before Mr. Miles? I don't remember. Okay, that's fair enough. Thank you. Peter Rick? Just a few more questions. Okay. Uh, if Miss Miles, Erica Castro Miles, had needed your help, would you have assisted her? Oh, yes. You were there for her. Immediately, I would have gotten. I would have been up at three in the morning to go wherever she went. She didn't ask. Me. She didn't ask help. Didn't ask help. No. Thank you. Any further. Brief. As you say, she would suffer in silence. Yes. So she didn't. She wasn't the type of person to go begging for help. Right. That's all. Any other questions? Thank you, ma'am. You may step down. You release from your subpoena. You may go. You may stay. <clears throat> They may call your next witness. Stay calls Angela Ezel. You'll step up, please, ma'am, and raise your right hand and face her clerk. Good afternoon. Hello. Will you state your full name for the court, please? Angela Clark Ezo. Thank you. Um, Ms. Ezo, I'll try to be really quick. Actually, will you spell your last name also? E Z is in zebra, E L L. Thank you. Um, on May the 30th of 2018, uh, where did you live? 
uh, Chapel Cemetery Road in Bonacqua. Okay. And on that morning, did you make a call to the Dixon County 911 Center? Yes, sir. Do you remember about what time that was? Probably around 6.20, 6.30, something like yeah. that. And why did you make that call? Um, because I came upon a car parked on the wrong side of the road facing the wrong direction and felt it was not proper for it to be there. I mean, it was literally parked in the wrong side of the road. Correct. Okay. And can you name the intersection of the two roads where you made this observation? Sam Vineyard and Tiddle Switch. Okay. And that's right. That's inside Dixon County? Yes. And you called 911 uh, to report your observations. Did you actually see any people within the car? Yes, sir. There was a gentleman in the driver's seat and a female in the passenger seat. What did you observe them to be doing? Um, they appeared to either be sleeping or passed out, very minimal movement, um, sitting in the car. Okay. And that was on the morning of May 30th of 2018? Yes, sir. I'll pass the witness. Any witness, any questions? Hopefully briefly, famous last words. Um, is it Ezel? Is that yes. how you say it? Okay. Yeah. So when you came upon this vehicle, did you stay in your vehicle the whole time? Yes, sir. Okay. Are you in like in a truck? That's right. I was in a truck. Okay. So you had a good view in. Yes, sir. Okay. And they appeared to be asleep. Either asleep or resting, passed, passed out, out, perhaps. Whatever. Okay. Part way. I mean, the butt of the car was still in the road, wasn't it? The whole car was in the road. The whole car. You saw a flat tire, you didn't see that. I did not see a flat tire. Okay, fair enough. Now, and you didn't know who was in the car. No idea. No idea that the Stephen Wiggins guy was driving. No idea that Miss Erica Castro Miles was in the passenger seat. No. Okay. And you would have called that in regardless of who it was. Correct. Okay. You had no idea that anyone in the car would have a warrant for their arrest. You had no idea the vehicle was reported stolen. Yeah. You only called this in because you saw a car that was very inappropriately parked in the roadway. Correct. Okay. Thank you very much. You redirect. Thank you, ma'am. You missed it. Thank you. We have another witness. Yes, Your Honor. Okay. State calls dispatcher Kim Wingate. Gonna say, You solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give in this case to be the truth, the truth, nothing but the truth, so help you guys. Hello, good afternoon, Ms. Wingate. Hello. Could you please uh, say your full name and then spell your last name for the court reporter? Uh -huh. Kimberly Lynn Wingate, W-I-N-G-A-T-E. And Ms. Wingate, how are you currently employed? Uh, by the Dixon 911 Emergency Communications. Okay, and what is your job duty there? Uh, I am the day shift supervisor. Okay. Um, now, the, the 911 emergency, does that also include dispatch? Yes. Okay. So now we, <laughs> we've already heard about 
the life of a dispatcher. Um, is Dixon Dispatch the same sort of situation where individual calls in, dispatchers take their phone call, they record them, they create what's called CAD reports? Yes. Is that true? Okay. Um, and do you have, could you briefly explain the 911 system um, as it records citizens' calls that are in, but it, does it also record officers' radio traffic? And could you explain what radio traffic is? Yes. Um, so every call, radio traffic, anything as far as transmissions that come in over the radio frequencies or go out over our frequencies are recorded. Um, every 911 on emergency line all the radio traffic for all police, fire, and EMS for Dixon County is recorded. Um, as far as the radio transmissions, how they work, it's just when someone basically presses the button to talk, it immediately starts recording. Now, for example, in, in this case, and you're familiar with why we're here today, correct? Yes, ma'am. On the call. Um, there's specific radio traffic um, in regards to this call. And that radio traffic would be officers keying up on the radio, calling into dispatch and trying to talk to each other. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, were you working, uh, you were working in the dispatch on uh, May the 30th of 2018. Is that correct? Yes. And did you know Sergeant Daniel Baker? Yes. Had you worked with him previously? Uh, we had worked together on the same shift for several years. Um, we had both changed to day shift about the same time. So I had heard his voice multiple times. I, I knew him very well. All right. Um, and specifically, we're talking about a, a 911 call that came in um, regarding the intersection of Tidwell Switch and Sam Vineyard Road for a vehicle parked on the wrong side of the road. Um, did you all produce a CAD report for that initial call? Yes. Your Honor, if I could approach the witness. You may. And do you, do you recognize what that document is? Yes, this is the incident, the CAD report from the incident that day at Tidwell Switch in San Vineyard. And when we say that incident, um, it's going to have information regarding the initial call in and then the subsequent law enforcement response. It's a very thick document. It has, does it have all of the subsequent police response to what they found and all the units that were involved? Correct. It goes from the original call to everything that progressed since then. And do you see at the top um, of the CAD report what time the original phone call came in? Uh, it was received at 619 that morning. And does it have a caller name? Uh, caller name says Angela. And does it give an event location and a comment? Yes, uh, the event location shows Sigil Switch Road and Sam Vineyard Road. And the comment reads, small 10, 90s model vehicle parked on the wrong side of the roadway. And then farther down, um, there are there's a narrative log. Um, in fact, your name, it looks like, uh, shows up in this report as well, correct? Yes. From the dispatchers. Yeah. Do multiple dispatchers key in on the same call if they receive information? Yeah, so whoever receives the information, whether it be on the radio or the phone, that's the dispatcher that enters it. They're responsible for making sure that information gets put where it needs to be put on the CAD. And then there are narratives that are also on there. Are those the dispatcher's notes to whatever's going on? Yes, it's always just a backup for us, um, even though everything's recorded. Uh, so that way we have a, like a paper log as well. Your Honor, I would move the, the CAD report as the state's next exhibit. Exhibit 29. Ms. Wingate, if you could hand that to Ms. 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 the clerk. Now, is there a 911 call associated with this incident? Um, there's a call. I don't, I think it came in on non emergency, if I remember correctly, oh, but it sorry. was a call for okay. that day, yes. But do you have emergency and non emergency go to the dispatch? Yes, everything comes into us. Okay. And have you listened to the 911 call? Yes. For this incident? Uh, Mr. Rutherford, if you could play that, please. It's trying. Call two on Wednesday, May 30th, 2018 at 619 AM with a GMT offset of negative 300 minutes. Agent ID is extension is 603. Communication is Stephanie, how may I help you? 
I'm Hi, Stephanie. I'm calling because there is a uh, car parked on the wrong side of the road with what appears to be two people either asleep or passed out in it. Okay, where is it at? It's at the end of Tiddle Switch and Sam Vineyard. Okay. Tiddle Switch and Sam Vineyard, you said? Mm-hmm. Okay, and what kind of vehicle is it? Um, a little Toyota, I think. Perhaps a Honda, a small, kind of probably 90s model car, kind of a tannish brown color. Okay. Um, and it's literally parked at the intersection on the wrong side of the road. And you said there's two people inside. Uh huh. And they like I I passed them and they neither one of them moved or looked at me or anything. Um, they looked they like they were sleeping. Like they were sleeping. Okay. sleeping or passed out. Um, All right. And what is your name? Angela. Air call back number for you, Angela. Nine three one nine nine six nine five four six. All right. I'll send somebody a route to uh, to switch road and stand in your and see if they can make contact with these vehicles. I just okay, vehicle. thank you. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Now we'd make this uh, call the state's next exhibit, which I believe is going to be number thirty. It will be on exhi- I'm sorry, a, uh, exhibit thirty. Hmm. Now, Ms. Winkie, um, when dispatch said that they would put a car in route. Um, do you all then notify the officers? They're not listening to this, correct? They're not listening to the dispatch. The dispatch then tells them what they're going to go see, correct? Correct. Okay. And in this case, um, are you also familiar with radio traffic that happened between the officers? Yes. Um, initially in this call, uh, was there something distressful that was noted? I might ha- hand this back to you. On line number two in the narrative? Uh, Yes, one of the other dispatchers who was on duty um, noted 500 radio was muffled, could tell there was distress. And do you know at the time who car 500 was? Yes, it was Sergeant Baker. And then subsequently after that, um, down to where your entry is, could you explain this? Um, So at that point, um, because we heard some type of the stress, we started trying to reach car 500 multiple times for what we call a status check. And that's just to get an answer from the officer to let us know that he's okay. Um, one of the other dispatchers had done it multiple times. Um, and then I actually had just come on shift. I hadn't even logged into a computer and heard this going on as I was getting ready to sit down and log in. And once I sat down, I started as well with status checks. Um, And then there were multiple um, other units that were trying to call for CAR 500 as well. Um, And um, I got an answer finally. Uh, We had all multiple times tried to call, no answer. Um, I think there was, I even tried to call him by phone on his cell phone, Sergeant Baker with no answer. And then finally there was an answer from 500 that it buys, they were 10 4. Now, is it, is it abnormal for an officer to not respond to you? Oh, yeah. Like, I mean, it, it does happen, but when it, it's not the norm, like it's immediate, like we go on alert mode, everybody's paying attention, they want to make sure that officer's okay. okay. And, and we just ask about that you said that the 500 advice status was 10 4. What is 10 4 to you all? That they're okay. And then um, there's one below it that says that there was one in custody. Mm-hmm. Um, is that a, is that based on radio traffic that dispatch received? Yes. Okay. Yeah, there was a, a transmission that come over that says 501 in custody. And I believe the wording was en route to Dixon Central. And that's recorded. And we're going to go yes. play that. Mr. Efferge, if you could play call for 20. Call 20. On Wednesday, May 30th, 2018, at 6.50 a.m. with a GMT offset of negative 300 minutes, agent ID is 
Extension is 115. Daniel, you good? Five hundred, it is showing confirmed out of Kingston Springs. In custody, one male on the way. Judy Now, is Wingate, was it, were any of those voices Sergeant Daniel Baker's? No. Um, so when you all were trying to reach car 500 and they said that everything was okay, that was not Sergeant Baker's voice? No. And another officer was asking, Daniel, you good? Do you know which officer that was? I believe it was Officer Chris Lashley. Okay. And then another dispatcher, I believe, keyed up and said that 500 confirmed out of Kingston Springs. What did that, what does that mean? And that was actually me. Um, that was to let him know that we, had, when he originally checked out, we had told him that the vehicle was stolen. And that was to let him know that Kingston Springs had confirmed that the vehicle was stolen the day prior. So that was dispatch trying to reach back out to who they thought was was Sergeant Baker to let them know that it was confirmed stolen. That's great. But none of those voices were dark were Sergeant Baker. No. And I'll move call number 20 in as the state's next exhibit. I believe that's number 31. Is and did you know whose voice have you found out whose voice that was on the call? I know now. At the initial time, I did not know. Do you know who it is? Uh, I believe it's Mr. Wiggins. Yes. Pass away. Lindley, any questions? Uh, yes, yeah, sorry. I had a couple things come up there. Uh, Ms. Wingate, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Now, you've been with dispatch for how long? It'll be 12 years this October. Okay. Now, you said something that kind of surprised me. I didn't realize every time an officer keyed up the radio and said something, it was recorded. Is that, is that what you said? It, it is in our center, yes. How long does it stay recorded in your center? That must be a lot of data to keep. Yeah, um, I don't know the exact time frame. Um, we have recently switched recording systems. So at that time, I, I, I honestly, I don't know how long it stays on file. Okay. Now, as a dis, you were working dispatch that morning. That's great. Now, did you hear? Wiggins come over the radio. I know you don't know, you didn't know at the time it was Wiggins, but you knew it wasn't Sergeant Baker's voice. Not initially. Uh, the first where um, 500 status is 10 for where I logged that, I did not realize at first that that was not Sergeant, Sergeant Baker. It was as the call progressed and more, Wiggins had said more on the radio that I realized it was not Daniel. Okay, that's, that's fine. Um, so, and when somebody hits the radio, everyone in the whole county can hear it? Well, not everyone, but I, everybody in the, in the sheriff's department can hear it. If they're on that frequency, yes. If they're on the same channel, when someone keys up and they have their radio on, yes, they can hear it. Do y'all normally use the same channel? Um, so we have a, what we call a county channel mm -hmm. and a city channel. So we have different, we have mid, several different channels that they operate. Normally the county all operates on the same channel. So all of uh, Dixon County Sheriff's deputies on duty should be able to hear what others are saying. As long as their radio is on, yes. Okay. okay. And they all know, I mean, this is common knowledge. This is being recorded anytime they key it in, right? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Thank you, ma'am. You may step down and you'll be released. All right, at this time, we're going to take our afternoon recess. We'll probably be on recess for about 20 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Sports and recess. Thank
third one is introducing a bunch of photographs, maybe more. Right. Well, you have children at home, I know, and I know so does General Crouch, but do you have any reason we couldn't go to a little bit later to finish these three? I don't think they'll kill each other, Judge. <laughs> That are enjoying while they're there when they go up and go away. <clears throat> I miss all of them. Well, I found that to be true. My oldest is 17 and my youngest is 10, and I'm you know, your child is 12. <laughs> <laughs> 19, actually. Um, college was interesting to have a baby on a, on, a, on a hip and a book in the other hand, but I made it through. <laughs> <laughs> we were live streaming uh, on the YouTube most of these things, and the videos that are shown are live streaming. We did not live stream the video of Mrs. Castro Miles when she fled the room going uh, unclosed. So. We ready? <laughs> Here's we're ready. So we're ready to bring the jury back. Bring the jury in. All right, we have everyone back, so we are ready. You may call your next witness. Hey, calls Chris Lashley. So lastly, if you'll come up, please face our clerk and be placed under oath. Please solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give in this case is the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God. Have a seat. You will please speak into the microphone, but you can. Good afternoon. How you doing, sir? Good, thank you. <clears throat> will you state your full name for the court, please? Yes, sir. It's Christopher Stanley Lashley. And will you spell your last name? L-A-S-H-L-E-E. -E. Okay. And where are you currently employed? Dixon County Sheriff's Office. And what's your position there? Corporal Patrol. And Corporal Lashley, I notice you've got uh, you've had a recent surgery. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Uh, are you are you still uh, here in official capacity? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, are you in too much pain today? All right. Not too bad. Well, thank you for being here. Appreciate it. <clears throat> so, Corporal Lashley, I want to take your attention back to May the 30th of 2018. Yes, sir. Uh, do you remember that day? Yes, sir. Okay. What, what shift were you working on May 30th? I was third shift, sir. Third shift. And yes, what time does, what time frame does third shift work? Third shift, we got off 7 a.m. Uh, 9, 10 at night, 7 a.m. Okay. 
And on uh, approximately 6 to 6.30 a.m. on May the 30th, were you dispatched to go to the intersection of Tidwell Switch Road and uh, Sam Vineyard Road in Dixon County? Yes, sir. <laughs> and did, where were you when you received the call? I was on Jones Creek in between Rock Church and Whitewater. Okay. And going to Sam Vineyard and Tidwell Switch, is that the southern end of Dixon County? Yes, sir. And I guess Jones Creek can be described as maybe the middle section of Dixon County? Yes, sir. So what's your approximate travel time to get over? 15, 20 minutes max. Okay. And can you describe what you observed as you were coming down Tidwell Switch and approaching the intersection of Tidwell Switch and Sam Vineyard? When, when I dropped off the hill and I could see, when I was able to see, I observed uh, it was a tan brownish colored vehicle parked at the intersection, Saturn car. I observed car 500 coming from behind it. It turned up. It, turn right on Tidwell switch and went right past me. I thought he was pulling in behind me. So just to be clear, you're coming in on Tidwell switch. Is that right? Yes, sir. <clears throat> and you literally drive past car 500. Yes, sir. What direction would, would, would car 500 have been taking a, I believe it would be a left on the Tidwell switch. Yes, sir. And you passed it at that intersection. I literally stopped at the intersection and it passed me by right there. Okay. Uh, can you see through your uh, vehicle into Unit 500? I could not see into it. I don't know if it was the sun that morning. I don't. I, I was focused on the scene when I was getting sure. down there. Okay. Uh, at the time, you didn't know that uh, Sergeant Baker was not driving that vehicle. No, sir, I did not. Okay. Um, what What did you do after you passed uh, Unit 500? I. Uh, I tried reaching Daniel over the radio. And when you say Daniel, we're talking about Sergeant Daniel Sergeant Baker. Baker. Okay. And he was unit 500. Yes, sir. And you attempted to reach him over the radio? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, and it's already been moved as an exhibit, but I'm going to play for you what's been uh, displayed as call 20. Call 20 on Wednesday, May 30th, 2018, at 6.50 a.m. for the GMT offset of negative 300 minutes. Agent ID is extension is 115. Daniel, you good? Okay, <clears throat> Deputy or Corporal Lashley, uh, was that you asking Daniel, are you good? Yes, sir. And what was the response back? One in custody. When, when you heard one in custody, uh, did, did that sound like Sergeant Baker to you? It did not, but I didn't get to speak with, I, I, I didn't work day shift. Sure. I didn't hear him on the radio much. I didn't know if it was worked up. So, so you didn't know for sure who it was? No, sir. Okay. Um, what, what else happened after you made this radio call? After I made the radio call, I, I literally got out and I observed the scene, um, seeing stuff that I seen bothered me. I tried, I tried calling. I, I actually called the cell phone. So the call that was just played was from your radio? Yes, sir. And is that within, within your patrol vehicle? Yes, sir. Okay. You actually get out at the scene yes. and there's a vehicle still there. Yes. You remember what type of vehicle it was? It was a Saturn. Saturn. And you see some things that you don't think are right. Right. And so you tried to call Sergeant Baker from your cell phone? Yes, sir. And what happened then? Uh, the phone was answered. Uh, the reception was real bad. I was trying to explain to him what I'd seen on the scene, shell cases, his, his key card, you know, the stuff I'd seen on the scene. And I, and I kept asking him, you okay? I'm fine. I'm fine. And before that call, do I need to keep going? Before that call dropped, I heard something. I heard him say, don't do that. You're going to get blood all over the place. And then I lost the call. So when you used your cell phone to call, call Sergeant Baker, somebody answered. Yes. And you were communicating with this person on the other end. Yes. Asking if he was okay. That's correct. And he was responding in the affirmative that he was okay? Yes. All right. 
Uh, did you attempt to also send a text message to Sergeant Baker? I did. And do you remember what that text message said? I asked. Uh, Would it help if I showed you a copy of it? I know what it is, sir. It's. <clears throat> It's a picture of blood on the side of the road. Daniel's sunglasses. Corporal Lashley, is, is this the text message that you sent to uh, Sergeant Baker? That's correct. And if you could identify what's on the screen, that the same text message that you're holding in your hand? Yes, sir. And I yes. guess this would be a screen capture of your phone. Yes. What, what did you text Sergeant Baker? I asked him if that says God's blood all over the road. Did you get a response? No, sir, I did not. And that appears to be at 7.08 a.m.? Yes, sir. And it has an exclamation point next to 7.08. What, what does that mean on your phone? On my phone, an exclamation point? I honestly could not tell you. I don't know what that means. Okay. The 7.10 does not have an exclamation point. Uh, the exclamation point, I do know what that means. It did not go through. Okay, so the first one didn't go through. Right. Uh, because you were in a bad cell phone area? Yes. But the second one did? Yes. Okay. And, and just to be clear, there's this top portion of the conversation, you up, is an entirely different conversation on a different day. Yes, sir. You texted him, I guess, to see if Domino's would deliver a pizza? Yes, sir. All right. Uh, that appears to be on May 26th. So this bottom portion, which is relevant to this case, was on May 30th of 2018. Yes, sir. All right. And this is a photograph that you took? Yes, sir. With is. your phone? Yes, sir. At the scene? Yes. All right. And I'll move that as the next exhibit, please. Mm -hmm. 31. 32. Can you identify this photograph? Yes, sir. That's a loaded pistol magazine in a digital scale on top of the vehicle. Now, this photograph obviously occurred later in time because there's some crime scene tape. Yes. But when you got out at the intersection of Tibble Switch and Sam Vineyard, uh, is this how the car appeared? Negative. No. no. The car was there. What's on top was it? I put that there. That's what I was getting to. When you got there, uh, was there anything on top of the car? Nothing. All right. Where did you find? Well, what are these two items? Those two items, the farthest from us is a loaded pistol magazine. Okay. And, and you say the furthest from us. You're referring to this item? Yes, sir. Okay. What's the item in front? It's a digital scale. Digital scales? Yes, sir. And, and one more time, where did you find those items? They were in the driver's seat. They were in the driver's seat. Yes. All right. Uh, were there any other items that you moved or manipulated before the crime not, scene? Not in the car. Everything started. It wasn't matches. So I backed away from the car. We dug into what was going on and it ended up being a whole lot more than towing a vehicle. I'll move that photograph as the next exhibit, please. From the exhibit 33. And that was what I was going to follow up with, Corporal, is uh, when you observed these items in the seat, had you, already, had you already taken the photograph of the blood on the ground? No, sir. Did you start looking around? I started, I started walking around just trying to put two and two together because beside the driver's door, I, I literally, I walked up to the vehicle, I, I opened up the driver's door and I took them and set them on the roof because I was going to have the vehicle towed. And I went to go get, when I went around the vehicle, I was going to the passenger side to get the registration. I was going to get it out of glove box or wherever I could find it. I found Daniel's key card laying directly behind the car. I walk back around to the driver's side and I start seeing empty shell casings on the ground. And it's just, everything just started. I started focusing on the surroundings instead of towing the vehicle because something didn't match. Absolutely. Uh, when you started looking around, were there any other persons or people anywhere in the area? When I first, I, I was there before anybody, shortly after I got there, Deputy Richley, Deputy Dearborn showed up on scene. Uh, right after them, Deputy Loveless showed up. And I immediately sent Deputy Loveless back towards dispatch 
to see if he could find car 500 because that's where he said he was in. So I sent him that way. And in between the text messages and all of that, I called our Lieutenant McCliss. And the reception was bad, but I asked him if he could track the GPS on Daniel or Sergeant Baker's vehicle. He had got back with us shortly after that and said it was a couple miles up the road in the field. And Deputy Richlick said he knew exactly where that was. Sent him there. We taped off the scene. We had a crime scene. And we, we stepped back and tried not to handle it any more than we had to at that point. At any time while you were there at the intersection of Tidwell Switch and San Vineyard, did you see the defendant, Erica Castro Miles? No, sir, and I was there immediately. She fled the scene. She was not there. Okay. I'll pass the witness. Any questions, Mr. You and Sergeant Baker, y'all were responding to the same call, is that correct? That's correct. And that came out as two people passed out in a vehicle, suspicious vehicle, right? Correct. Okay. And at the time when you got the call, no big deal, no rush to get there. You were just driving regular. Correct. Okay. And then commotion happens on the radio. Right? That's correct. And then you got in a bigger hurry. I got in a bigger hurry when they said the vehicle was stolen. Okay. So that was before the commotion. Then. Okay. Understood. So you got there as quick as you could get there once you realized there was a, it was more than just two people passed out on the side of the road. That's correct. Understood. Now, as you arrive on the scene, you see, I'm going to say Sergeant Baker's vehicle, <clears throat> excuse me, Sergeant Baker's vehicle, patrol car 500, as it's been called too, right? You see it? I do. It's facing you? Oh, it's I'm coming down the hill at the intersection. It come from where Daniel's body was shot and then turned right by me. Went right by me. Close enough he could have knocked up the window. I'm sorry, I know this Sergeant Baker was a friend of yours. He was a co-worker as well. I'm I'm sorry for your loss. You missed Stephen Wiggins putting him in that patrol car by a minute, right? Maybe That's even correct. less than that. Um, and as you arrived, I assume you're scanning the whole area to an extent. Correct. And you don't see Miss Erica anywhere. She wasn't on the scene. Thank you. Not after the vehicle left. And you, as you get there, the vehicle is leaving. That's correct. So if she was able to get away from the scene, she would have left presumably minutes before to in order to clear the I area. I can't answer that question. Okay, that's fine. And when you saw Sergeant Baker's patrol car, you didn't see an additional person in the passenger side, correct? Correct. So I at the point where you hear one in custody, you need a break? Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, at the point where you hear one in custody, you know that so there's a missing person, right? Correct. Okay. Now, I understand where you are, uh, or where the scene is, there's bad cell phone reception. Correct? Correct. And the radio doesn't work very well either? Correct. So you were trying to radio for Sergeant Baker and you couldn't hardly get through to him. Is that, and that's why you called him? Correct. And then you sent a, a text message. Was that any reason you didn't call the blood out over the radio? I figured if I could get through to his phone, he would be the best answer. And that was a I mean, that was a lot of blood you saw. Correct. So you knew somebody had to been hurt really bad. Is that right? I suspect. Is there any reason you didn't put that out on the radio as soon as you saw it? 
the radios wasn't working on the bottom. That's where I was. And now if, if Sergeant Baker would have departed the scene before you got there, that would have been a breach of protocol. Is that right? I'm not following you. What do you mean? Well, he would have been leaving the scene unsecured. Without me being there? Well, I mean, if they were pulling off immediately, there's a missing person, one of the two people. There's a vehicle that's unsecured. I mean, is that normal or would that be abnormal? I guess is what I mean to say. There was nothing normal about that day. I understand. I'm not trying to pick too much. I'm just trying I, to. There was there was nothing normal about that day. It's from the from the moment you arrived, this was all wrong. Is that right? Yes and no. Yes and no. So the radio didn't work at all where you were? Unless I walked up the hill. Okay. And, and how long of a walk would that have been? Uh, I couldn't even tell you. Like a minute, five minutes? Or, uh, I, I didn't time it out, I can't tell you. Okay. But I mean, we got a missing person. We got a crime scene we were trying to get taken care of. Okay, we got several things going on. We reached out to our superiors, got things going, trying to figure stuff out. Okay, now as far as getting up the hill to use a radio, when I can hold my cell phone and try to get a hold of him right there while I'm looking at the scene, I'm going to use my cell phone. That's I would do I'm, the same thing if it was you laying there. I, I'm just figuring, I'm just asking questions. I have to ask questions. Okay. So you were able to reach superiors and you did that on your cell phone, you're saying? Yes. <laughs> and you advised them of what you, was going on, I assume? Yes. All the things you'd found? Yes. Thank you very much. No further, no further questions. Thank you, Corporal Ashley. You may step down and you may leave or you may stay. Thanks, sir. Okay, you may call your next witness. Stay call Steve Richlick. Step right up, raise your right hand and face our clerk. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give in this case is portrayed in the law So we hope you guys. Good afternoon. We you state your full name for the court? Stephen Charles Richley. 
Thank you. And will you spell your last name, please? R-Y-C-H-L-I-K. Thank you. And Deputy Richlick, where are you employed? Dixon County Sheriff's Office. And how long have you been employed there? 21 years. Is that all? I'm just Almost 22. <laughs> I think you and I started just about the same year. Yes, sir. <clears throat> so, uh, Deputy Richlick, let's go back to May the 30th of 2018. Were you, were you working for the Dixon County Sheriff's Office? Yes, sir. And what was your position then? Patrol deputy. Patrol deputy. And what shift were you working? First. First shift. Yes, sir. Is that the same shift with Sergeant Daniel Baker? Yes, sir. Yes, my sergeant. Okay. And on the morning of April or May the 30th of 2018, uh, did you hear Sergeant Baker uh, check out or check in to dispatch in response to a call for a disabled vehicle on Tibble Switch in Sam Vineyard? Yes, sir. Uh, did you also hear that call? I was coming on when the call came out. Yes, sir. Okay. Or was it a call for – describe the call. He was en route to a call, and then he checked on the scene. Okay. And that's when I was getting in my car, start my, start my morning. So when you say start your morning, was there a routine for the shift to start a morning? <clears throat> yes, we – go meet at the sheriff's office in the morning, kind of have roll call and shift meeting before we go to our zones and get started for the day. Would it have been customary for Sergeant Baker to come to the shift meeting? Yes, sir. Because he was the shift sergeant? Yes, sir. All right. But on May 30th, he did not. No, sir. He checked out to respond to a call. Uh, at some point, you went in route to Sam Vineyard and, and Tibble Switch. And why did you go in route? <clears throat> it was... You heard Daniel's voice kind of over the radio. Um, <clears throat> kind of excited. Sounded like shots fired. So, Dearborn and I, that's when we head that way. You hear something over the radio that sounded like shots fired. Yes, sir. And in response, you decided to go to this location. Yes, sir. How did you know where to go? Um, they as... said where the call was. Okay. And so that's where we were going to. So dispatch knew that Sergeant Baker was on scene or on location at Tidwell Switch in Sam Vineyard. And then you yes. hear shots fired. This is what it sounded like on the radio. And it was, it wasn't for him to be overly excited. So the voice and kind of cracked up on what we heard got our attention. And, and, and I want to be specific. When you're saying shots fired, you heard Sergeant Baker say the words. That's shot what fired. it sounded like to us. You didn't actually hear gunfire. No. You heard Sergeant Baker say shots fired. That's what I remember hearing. Okay. And at that point, you go en route towards South Dixon County. Yes, sir. How long does it take you to get on scene? I don't know. I don't know how long it took us. We got there as, as fast as we could. Who was on scene when you arrived? When I pulled up, Joe Lovelace and um, Lashley, Chris Lashley were on scene already. Okay. And when you get out of your vehicle on scene, do you have a body camera? I do. And did you turn activate it? Yes, sir. Okay. Is that customary to activate your body camera? Yes, sir. All right. Or may I approach the witness? You may. This case has a copy of your body camera. Yes, sir. Put those as the next exhibit. Collect the next collective exhibit. Collective exhibit 34. All right. And deputy, is this the beginning of your body camera video? <clears throat> Best of your recollection. Can I get a from yes, sir? Yes, I'm yes, sir. Okay. Right. So was that you that said right? Yes, sir. So had you just gotten out of your patrol car? Yes, sir. Walking walking up to the to the scene. Uh, what, just give the jury an idea of 
what exactly you're doing and why you're looking at this car. What, what do you think is going on right now as we see this image? <clears throat> There's no one around the vehicle. Supposedly, he's already left to dispatch before we arrived on scene. And unlike what would normally happen, and then just kind of looking around the car. Just you want me to like? No, that's good. We're I, just I trying. Just, we're just looking at the scene, trying to figure out what's going on because it's kind of all, off to all of us. And that's what I was getting at. Was, was there some confusion as to what was happening? Yes, sir. It seemed off. Wouldn't leave the scene before then, like like it happened. Okay. Blood. Blood. He and I were on the phone, and when Baker left, it did not sound like him talking on that radio. When he said it'd be around the dispatch, remember that? Yeah. That was not Baker talking on the radio. But you saw him leave? Yep. He well, was I saw the vehicle. I didn't see him. He, he kind of glitched by me real quick. Why wouldn't he wait for us to get here before he I left? Don't know. I ain't got service. Hey, uh, Keith. His key card's on the ground over here. Baker, and there's a button on the ground over here. Hey, one of. I don't feel. Hey, that was not him on the radio, was it? Hey, I'm going to pull the other side of it and get it blocked off. What did I say? Hey. Anybody checking the ditch for anything dead? Hey, 
Just making sure it's like not like a dead deer or something right over here. No, that amount of blood. And then the skid marks, could have been a deer? But then I don't like the sunglasses in the same spot either. See, I don't think it's the same thing. Look at the oil. I don't know. Keith, this is all oil, not from that. So that could have been a deer hit, but I don't like the glasses and his key card. And you see the button? The button's like right between. It would have been right there. Because when I come. I come down, Daniel's car was pulling from right over there. Was it? Yeah. Why was Daniel over here anyway? He just checked into it and he got here quick, but I was coming from almost white bluff on Jones Creek. So were they looking for a stolen car in the area? No. Or a reckless Somebody, driver? This guy was passed out there. Oh. What they called in said there were two people in there. It makes sense. There's a lot of female shit in there. Is there any shell casings in here? Yeah, it's all over the next floor. The button should be in front of you, 10 feet on the ground, between it or closer to his key card. <clears throat> It's one of our buttons, right there. Okay. That's one of our buttons. How did Channel 6 get here so quick? There's a, I don't know. There's a lot of unanswered questions. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that's just not added up. And they still can't get a hold of Baker? Have they not? I can't hear anything on the radio down here. There's no service down here. I'm just trying to document everything I can see. But I don't see, the blood goes this way. Yeah, I don't like they know. put it, but that's his key card. I mean, it's Joe would jump on call, call Daniel or what? Yeah, well, he couldn't get a hold of him. I mean, do we need to rope it off? Do we need to clear? What do we need to do? What do we got out here? No service. And there's nothing down here. That's what we sent Joe up there for to kind of give us a heads up what we need to do. Got. Yeah. What happened then? We don't know if those show, showcasing come out when they got them out of the car or what. I, I don't know. Was the car sitting there? It's got a flat tire. Was the car sitting there or was it sitting down here? Supposedly, what Chris just told me is the call came out of somebody in this vehicle passed out. I thought they right said here. there was two of them. That's what we thought too. But the car was right here and the driver was passed out. Did the car come back stolen? Yeah. Okay. So my question is, 
Why did he rush up and get him to PD? Why did he stay here? All right. Okay. Yeah. 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 Those are tools on the floorboard, not casings. <clears throat> yeah. So they're all sockets. Yeah. We don't have a gun yet. No. Who's that? Hey, my old you on the left side. Chris, what did you figure out? No one can get a hold of them. Huh? No one can still get a hold of them. Anytime I call, I don't know something. I, when I called and I talked to him earlier, yeah, and I don't talk to Daniel a whole lot. Of right, people, but something sounded different. Yeah, okay. and that wasn't him on the radio when we were on our way here. Like when you were like you know uh, talking to him on the radio. Yeah. Then you heard, "I'll be on the way to dispatch." Yeah. That wasn't Baker talking. Really? See if you can get a hold of Joe. Right? One bar. I got one bar. Yeah. That was me. I waved him through. Oh, okay. 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 It was right after I got here. Not even that long. Okay, I thought I thought he was mistaken. 
And uh, I heard the music and then it ended. But somebody pushed me. I don't know how they Oh, that's what you hear. Nothing. What it sounded like to me, he said, I'm going to route the dispatch. That wasn't Baker that talking. Didn't, that didn't sound like Baker on the radio. It sounded like a, a black person. Well, just, I, I'm just saying. Yeah. And I, I don't know. That's what made me think that somebody, that somebody get in his vehicle, you know, they take his vehicle. And... Yeah. I thought I was looking to see if there was a body going off. That's what I thought at first. I mean, Radio. The uh, those were sockets in the floorboard. Yeah. Is there? I didn't. I couldn't see them. <clears throat> I mean, I, I don't. It, it doesn't. What doesn't make sense to me is you wouldn't have told big ones. You wouldn't have made one. Exactly. Go ahead for 504. Yes, yeah, sir. We've got real bad service right here. Let's try. Stand behind this car. We say? I just stand behind this car with my head just right. I have nothing to bite. I got one bar. Let me see if I can get hold of them. Oh, yeah, I have zero. Yeah, I've got nothing. I'm, I'm out there. <coughs> Put them on speaker. Yeah. <clears throat> Hello? Hey, boss. Hey, man, are you guys looking for, for a baker? We've got shell casings on the ground. We've got blood. We've got his key card. We've got uniform buttons on the ground. It's so sun car is off of Bird Road Park. In that ain't cool, dude. He said, hey, Jeff, hey, listen, when he, he, somebody, it wasn't him on the radio that said he checked in route the dispatch. Uh, his car shows parked off of Bird Road right now uh, in between Bear Creek, Valley Road, and uh, South Bear Creek. Well, something's up because that's not cool. Switch. Yeah, me, Chris, and Steve, all three of us down here. We got, the, we got it locked down. You want me to head down there? Go back up to uh, Bear Creek Valley Road, make a right, and in, uh, follow Bear Creek Valley down. Uh, I know where that is. And on your left, it'll be off to the Do you want to run up there, Steve? You know what's up? It's been there for. Um, oh, that didn't see. But it's parked off, off the road over there. All right, I know where that is. That's Steve Gilkin. All right. All
Deputy Richland, were you able to see the video? Yes, sir. And I think your video ends right there. Yes, sir. Now, <clears throat> uh, we're going to go, we're going to talk in a minute about where you go next. But before you leave uh, the crime scene here, I want to talk about a few items that you discussed or, or, or on your body cam. First, uh, you said that there's two missing people. Is that right? Or oh, somebody said two. The ones in the car. Yes. Supposedly, okay. from what so they said on the radio. It was dispatched in as two people in the car, and these two people are nowhere to be found. No, sir. And neither is Sergeant Baker. Yes, sir. All right. Uh, you you mentioned something about not him on the radio. Could you tell that it was not Sergeant Baker? Yes, sir. Uh, what what is a what is a key card? Key cards, kind of a thicker card we have. We got these little. Uh, scanners on the door of the sheriff's office and the jail and all that. We just keep them in our pocket and just pull the card out and you just touch the side of the door and it unlocks the door for us to go in the office. So it's a little bigger than a credit card, about twice as thick. And we all have, we all have one to get in the office. Did you observe one on the ground? Yes, sir. Did it look like a key card for the Dixon County? It was a key card. It was a key card. That was one of our cards. Okay. Uh, that caught your attention? Yes, sir. Now, you described a button. Yes, sir. What kind of button? On our old uniform, our blue uniforms, there's a blue button. They're all the same size. And it was just like one of the buttons from our shirts. Okay. And to be clear, uh, you're wearing a different uniform yes, today than you were then. Same one, same uniform you saw in the video is what we had then, which is the, the, like the French blue and the buttons were almost the same color as the uniform. You saw a key card, a button, and a pair of sunglasses? Yes, sir. Where did you see the sunglasses? Sunglasses were thinking where the blood was just to the the left out on the road a little more. Oh, and they were the, broken right there. And that's right what I was going to ask, if they were intact or broken. They were broken. I think the, the lens was, tore, uh, if you're looking off the road at the where the blood was, it was to the left behind me more. Okay. You walk back towards the Saturn, and did you observe something sitting on top? The, uh, there was a, a magazine with uh, 45 cal rounds in it. It, it looked and like a you scale. Had, and a scale? A scale. So a digital scale and a digital magazine. Scale. Yes, sir. It looked like you actually picked up the magazine. I did. And did you take a round out to see what caliber it was? I don't think I took a round out. How did you know it was a 45? I know rounds. Okay. You know. Just your familiarity yes, with sir. ammunition? Yes, sir. And that was a 45. Yes, sir. What was a 45 significant to you in any way? Larger caliber. Okay. And what uh, standard ammunition and weapon? Is we carried a 40 at that time. A 40 caliber. A 40 caliber, which is smaller, a little, bit, it's a little smaller than a, a 45. Uh, did you open the driver's side door to the center? Did it operate correctly? Yes, sir. No problem opening it? No, sir. Now, this location, Tidwell Switch and Sand Vineyard, is in Dixon County. Yes, sir. Uh, but we could hear you speaking to someone on the phone near the end of this video. Was that McCliss? Yes, that was McCliss. Jeff McCliss? Yes, sir. What was his position at the time? I think he was, he was a patrol lieutenant. Was he giving you information about the current location of Sergeant Baker's patrol yes, unit? How could he do that? We had GPSs put in our cars. Um, it was just for reasons like this. And we, we've had him, I don't think too long when they, after this happened. But he literally in real time told you where, where everyone was at. Okay. And he gave a location for Sergeant Baker's vehicle. He did. And I think it said off bird road in Hickman County. Yes, sir. Uh, Bear Creek Valley road and South Bear Creek. Yes. And was that you that said, I know where that is. Yes, sir. And did you go there? I did. Okay. And what happened when you got there? And by the way, about how far is it from Tidwell Switch Sam Vineyard over to the location where you? Uh, it's, I'm thinking it was over about two miles, maybe. Not that far. Back to where South Bear Creek is. And then it was, it was a couple miles down okay. to where the other. I'm going to ask you to identify this photograph. 
Yes, sir. Uh, now, what is the standard? That's where the fence was down. So on the phone, we heard Jeff McClis give you uh, a location for even 500. Yes. And you drive over there. Yes. And is this Bear Creek Valley Road? Where this is, um, this is actually, I think, that Bird Road. Bird Road. Yeah. Okay. But Bear Creek turns into that. So, same, yeah. This photograph has been manipulated. Is that right? Yes. Did, did you draw that red line on I it? I did. And why is that? Um, that morning that I was driving down that road. If you ever driven down like dirt roads or gravel roads, after someone's driven down it, you see there's a color change in the in the dirt or the rocks. So it's like a chert road, kind of the side of what you see the dirt. And it, in the mornings, you know, you turn some over, it's gonna be a damp just from overnight. So when I'm driving down the road, I see fresh tire marks where we'll say somebody just driven before me. You still see it where it's wet. And then I see. <clears throat> To the left, the fence is down right where there's a sharp turn where the chert was turned. And the barbed wire fence is down, the poles are down. The grass in that field <clears throat> was as high as the highest point in those, the, the grass in front of the fence. And the grass was laid down with tire marks going into the field. So Deputy Russell, this photograph is obviously taken on a later date. Yes, sir. Uh, at the time when you arrived on the morning of May 30th, Right here at this red line was the fence down. Yes, sir. Where it appeared something had driven through it. Yes, sir. And the grass was high. Yes, sir. Uh, but there were tire marks. Yes, sir. The vehicle had driven in. Yes. Did, did you drive? Did you also drive through? I the went fence? through the fence too. Yes. You sir. went through the fence. I did. And what'd you do then? Um, I drove through the fence probably <clears throat> I don't really remember really how far. Um, I think it was about to the left of the tree in the center that's down in the field. And uh, the tracks just went further. And I know that Baker had a sub gun, shotgun, a rifle, and two pistols that would have been in that vehicle. And I didn't feel that was the best idea to drive all the way up on the vehicle if somebody would have had those weapons and they were in play. I mean, you knew something was wrong. Yes, sir. You heard a suspicious voice. Two people are missing. Sergeant Baker's missing. And now a vehicle has driven through this field. Yes, sir. So you stop your, your patrol. I did. And you get out. I did. Now, did you still have your body cam on? I had my body cam on when I got out of the car. I opened the door. I grabbed my rifle and I put it over and it knocked my body camera off onto the ground and I picked my body cam back up and I put it back on. And I, I remember when I got out of the car, I turned it on. And I think at the same time as I was turning it on is when I was putting my sling over. And I think that when I knocked it off, it shut it back off. Either way, we don't have body, no, body cam that. if you go in further. Yes, in. sir. All right, so just give us your best description of what you did uh, once you put on your I put on my rifle and I walked the tree line that was to the left. Um, to the left of his tracks going into the field, just try to have um, some concealment if there was somebody else out there. Um, at the end, I followed the tree line about maybe 20 yards down the tree line. I heard Cave on the radio, Deputy Cave. And I heard his car coming down the road and I told him, you're about to pass me. It's, I'm right, I think it was somebody that knew, I'm right here. And uh, he came down the right side of the field. And uh, as he's almost to me, I can see the top of the, the top of uh, Baker's vehicle. Uh, did you progress towards Sergeant Baker's vehicle? Yes, sir. What did you do? Um, come up on the vehicle. Doors were locked, um, closed and locked. Um, looked in the window. I didn't see anything. Um, the windows are so tinted on the back windows, you can't see. And uh, of course, checking the doors and uh, started yelling for them. Any response? Nothing. All four of the doors were locked? All the doors were locked. 
back hatch is closed. Yes, sir. Those back hatches, do they lock automatically? On that model, I'm I'm pretty sure, you know, of course, um, I think it had a, the key that you can open the back, but um, we checked all the doors and everything was locked. And, and the windows are tinted and you couldn't see through? Couldn't see in the back. So what'd you do after that? Um, walked around the vehicle, um, looking for footprints, any, any grass down. And on the other side of where he was parked, there's a, uh, a barbed wire fence and it was like the only dirt spot there had a perfect print where somebody was like, they stepped over there or going through the fence or trying to go over the fence. There was a shoe print in the dirt on the other side of his vehicle at the fence. Did and you follow that? We went over the fence, yes, sir, but couldn't tell where it went from there. The photograph in your hand, I'll move is the next exhibit. Exhibit 35. Don't pass the witness. Good afternoon. Uh, say your name for me one more time. Deputy Stephen Richlick. 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 I'm sorry. This is Richlick. Richlick. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, thank you. Yes, sir. Now, you had testified earlier that Sergeant Baker, I think you said something, or maybe it was on the body cam footage, that he wouldn't leave the scene like it happened. Yes. That, is that something? Can, yes, sir. Okay, so what would normally happen in a situation like, I mean, not like what occurred, but like what you thought was happening when you were coming up on the scene? You're, you know, if Sergeant Baker was just responding to a stolen vehicle and there was a commotion, what would you be expecting? Him to still be on the scene. Okay. Don't, not to leave a stolen vehicle or um, it'd be unlike one of us to take off without talking to the other. You know, somebody's close. Oh, he's, you know, make contact with somebody, let them know what's going on. Hey, stand by with the car. Will you get it towed for me? Get a tow slip for me? Um Something like that, but not leave the vehicle before somebody else got there or anything like that. Okay. And I noticed there's a break in your body cam footage. Uh, it looks like when you came up on the blood, you did you turn it off? Not that I remember. Okay. It just kind of ended and then picked back up. You know, not That's sure. the second time I've seen the video. And... I don't really hear a lot of radio traffic coming in, but when you drove a little bit past where the blood was and you stopped your car, I could hear traffic coming in there. So is that, was traffic, were you able to hear the radio just in that one spot or? When I was out there, it was patchy. You'll hear a, like a like a loud beep every once in a while. It's just our radios don't have service. Sometimes they'll do just this loud, um, just a loud noise, like a loud beep. <clears throat> Just when you're out of service, you don't have any connection. It's not a permanent beep. It's just a. If it was, as long as you're out of service, it'll do it every every few seconds. Okay. And do y'all turn them down so you don't have to hear the beep if you're in a bad spot? If you're in a bad spot and you know you don't have service there, yeah, turn it down, but just not off. Okay. I, I mean, I wasn't hearing any beeps. No, because it'll come in, it'll go in and out. You'll have maybe one bar and then it'll be nothing. You know, just every few seconds, but you still, you still don't get, per, you know, good traffic, you know, good reception. Do the radios work off of cell phone towers or something like that? Or do you know? I really don't know how, I know it's uh, digital. Okay. Well, I was just kind of curious right. because I, I know y'all are sometimes able to get a call out when you're on the scene and then right. sometimes not, and the radio might work and then yeah. not. So. It's a low area too. Okay. When you're out in the middle of nowhere in a low area, it's, you know, understood. Um, yeah. I have any questions for you, Deputy? One second, please. Pass the witness. Thank you very much. Thank you, brother. Mr. Lesley, to step down. State calls Stephen Kennard.
Father, please let your right hand be placed on the road. Please solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give in this case is the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help you guide. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good morning. Good afternoon. Can you state your full name for the record, please? Uh, Stephen Kennard. And where are you employed? Uh, Tennessee Bureau of Investigation. What's your position with the TBI? A special agent. Thank you. Agent Kennard, uh, how long have you been employed with the TBI? Uh, approximately 12, 12 and a half years. And uh, what does a special agent do? A, well, my particular position, I'm a field agent, uh, and I we investigate a variety of different crimes, uh, anything from homicide to officer-involved shootings to white-collar crime. Okay. On May the 30th of 2018, you were employed with the TBI as a special agent. I was. Uh, were you called to work an investigation uh, in Dixon County, Tennessee? I was. And do you know how you received that call? Uh, how I received, received it via telephone from my supervisor at about 9 o'clock that morning. 9 o'clock that morning? Yes, sir. And did you respond to Dixon County? I did. And what was your initial assignment? Uh, my initial assignment was to, to respond to the intersection of uh, Temple Switch Road and San Vineyard Road. Okay. And before we get into that, mm -hmm. <clears throat> by the time you arrived in Dixon County, were there uh, multiple law enforcement agencies responding to the area? Uh, yes. And why is that? Well, it was my understanding that uh, there was a shooting involving a police officer and that uh, a possible suspect was still uh, on the loose. And so I think that the calling everybody to attend to that. So by nine o'clock that morning, uh, no one was in custody. So multiple agencies have been brought in for the manhunt. That's correct. Okay. Now, <clears throat> when you get to the intersection of uh, Sam Vineyard and Tidble Switch, uh, did you have a specific assignment? I was just told to respond to the scene. Um, I was the first TBI agent to, to uh, arrive at the scene. Uh, so. And what did you do? Uh, upon my arrival, I made contact with the, uh, the personnel from the local department that were there. Uh, spoke with them briefly to get a just a, a quick synopsis of the uh, of what was going on and what this particular location held within the situation. And uh, after after getting that information, began to process the scene. And the information that you had at nine o'clock that morning, did you really know what all had happened? Uh, very little. Very little. Very little. So you're you're literally trying to uh, document clues at Sam Vineyard and Tidwell Switch Road. That's correct. I approach the witness. You may. Now, Agent, I've got quite a few photographs that I want to go through. Yes, sir. This first document, I believe, is your handwritten diagram of the crime scene. Okay. Can you identify that document? Yes, this is a, uh, a crime scene diagram of the intersection of uh, San Vigna Road and Tidwell Switch. And is that in your handwriting? That's not my handwriting. That's the uh, layout that you described for someone to diagram? That's correct. And just describe to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury what this is we're looking at so that as we go through the evidence, it makes sense. Okay. So what we're looking at here is a, it's a three-way intersection. Uh, Tidwell Switch is running north and south uh, on the right side of this. And then Sam Vineyard Road comes from the west and then intersects uh, Tidwell Switch from the left side if you're looking at the diagram. <coughs> And how do you number these pieces of evidence? Um, after the initial walkthrough, we will identify what items of evidence we determine to be uh, useful or potentially useful. And then uh, after we uh, after we you know find everything, we will proceed to give them each an uh, individual number. So when you start, you don't 
necessarily know what will be useful to this investigation or not. That's correct. Uh, you, you number things that may have some potential evidentiary, var evidentiary value? Is yes, that sure. Okay. And once they are numbered, are, are they collected at some point? They are. And before they're collected, are they photographed? They are, yes. Right. I'll move the diagram in as the next exhibit. All right, Agent Kennard, what number was that? 36. 36, okay. This next exhibit is going to be Collective Exhibit 37 that I moved in, but it's going to have quite a few photographs, okay? Okay. You know what, Agent Kennard, what I'll do instead of making it a collective exhibit, I'll do <clears throat> numerically starting with 37. Is that okay with you, Madam Clerk? Thank you. All right. So the first photograph, can you then identify that for us, please? Yes, this is a view, uh, a photograph looking down south on uh, Tidwell Switch. I'm standing on Tidwell Switch looking towards Sam Vineyard Road. And is that the uh, Saturn vehicle we see? Yes, that's a Saturn sedan vehicle, yes. I'll move that as Exhibit 37. One. And what's the next photograph? The next photograph is I have proceeded further south down Tibble Switch towards the towards that intersection, and then you can see the more clearly the Saturn vehicle okay. in that photograph. Uh, and Agent Kennard, this is a, I guess what I'll call a closer up view of the Saturn. Yes, sir. Uh, can you describe the front driver's side tire in relation to the white line? Uh, it looks like it has crossed over the white line. It's either crossed up, part of it is over, and some of it is on the white line. Yes, sir. That is What's the next photograph? Next photograph is even a further close up of the uh, vehicle and then the, the ground just to the right of the driver's side of the vehicle. Okay. And in this photograph, is the front driver's tire uh, on and over the white line? It is. Right. Move that as exhibit 39. And the next photograph. The next photograph is a close-up of a, a spent uh, cartridge case uh, from a pistol, and then it's got a, a little yellow piece of tape next to it. Now, that yellow piece of tape, did you put that there? No, sir. So somebody on scene before you marked the shell casing with a piece of yellow tape? That's correct. Move that as Exhibit 40. And what is this photograph? This is a photograph of the driver's side of the vehicle, of the Saturn vehicle. And what do we see on top? Uh, on top, there are two items. Um, they're kind of hard to make out in this particular photograph, but they are a pistol magazine with uh, with unfired rounds still contained within it. And then a, the smaller square thing to the right is a black digital scale. Move that as exhibit 41. What's this photograph? This is a photograph of a, another uh, spent uh, cartridge case on the ground, just on the edge of the roadway, uh, close to the vehicle. And this is a separate shell casing than we previously saw. That's correct. So that's two so far. Two so far, yes, sir. Move that as exhibit 42. And what is this photograph? So this is a photograph from the other side of the vehicle. <clears throat> Excuse me. So now I'm standing on Sam Vineyard, looking north uh, up Tidwell Switch at the, at the rear of the vehicle. And then the passenger side as well. All right. And can you describe the rear passenger tire? Uh, it appears to be flat. That is exhibit 43. Uh, what is this photograph? This is a photograph of the interior of the vehicle from the passenger side. So this would be the front passenger seat and then the floorboard as well. And Agent Kennard, I'm going to ask you to uh, describe some of the items in this photograph that I point to. Okay. Uh, it looks like boots. It looks like a pair of glasses. A uh, flashlight. A uh, set of keys. <coughs> now, before we move to the next photograph, uh, again, at this point in time, do, you, do any of these items have relevance to you? while you're taking these photos? Not that I know of. You don't not, know not what at they the time. Mean. Correct. Okay. <coughs> Next photograph. 
<clears throat> what do we see here? This is a photograph of the front dashboard and front area of the, of the Saturn vehicle. That is exhibit 45. And the next photograph? The next photograph is the, uh, it's from the passenger side of the Saturn vehicle uh, facing back towards the back seats, but you see the two, the front driver's seat and the passenger seat. And Agent Kennard in this photograph is the passenger, front passenger window partially down? It is, yes. Now, how far down is it? Uh, roughly two thirds of the way, half to two thirds of the way, I believe. I'll move that as exhibit 46. Can you describe this photograph? Yes, this is a photograph, a closer up view of the top of the vehicle, top of the Saturn vehicle, and the item on the left is the digital scale, and then the item on the right is the pistol magazine with the, the unfired rounds inside. Move that as exhibit 47. <coughs> Agent Kennard, what does this photograph depict? This is a photograph looking west down Sam Vineyard, so you see the right. Uh, on the right side of the, the photograph, there's the tail end of the vehicle. Move that as exhibit 48. And Madam Clerk, if I get too far ahead, let me know. You're fine. All right. Next photograph. Okay, this is also a photograph. I'm now standing on Sam Vineyard uh, Road looking west and down the roadway. So, Agent Kennard, it's kind of hard to see uh, from this viewpoint what these items are. What, why did you take this particular? Uh, just as an overall photograph, just it, which is standard for us to take an overall photograph of the scene to try to encompass as much as we can. Okay. And now you're some distance beyond the Saturn, is that right? Yes. Move that as exhibit 49. Can you identify this photograph? Uh, this is a photograph of a what appears to be or appeared to be at the time a key card of some sort laying in the middle of the roadway on Sam Vineyard. And again, is that a piece of yellow crime scene tape? Yes, it is. And you didn't drop that there. That's correct. That's somebody else did. It was there when yes, when we were when I arrived. Move that as exhibit 50. All right, Agent Kennard, can you identify this photograph? All right, this is a photograph of <clears throat> the roadway on Sam Vineyard. Uh, a couple of items in there. Uh, there's a piece of the yellow tape um, knotted up. Next to that, it's marking the, the small item, which is a blue button right next to the up, upper left side of the piece of tape. And then also you can see the, what appears to be a reddish brown stain on the pavement as well. Yeah, I see what appear to be a couple of reddish brown stains here, here, above the button. That's correct. And this is closer to the one. It is, yes. Next photograph. Oh, that's it. And what does this photograph depict? Okay, the next photograph is again looking down west on San Vineyard Road. Uh, just a kind of an overall photograph to. It's a closer view of what's a little further down the road. And Agent Kennard, <clears throat> are you starting to see? You've already documented some blood on the roadway. Yes. Or, or as you say, reddish brown stains. That's correct. Uh, are these reddish brown stains? They are. And are they leading to the bright red pool of blood? Uh, yes, they are. That is exhibit 52. And what does this photograph depict? This is a photograph looking back east on uh, Sam Vineyard Roadway. So I've gone all the way down to uh, where the, the crime scene tape was put up uh, prior to our arrival, looking back east towards Tibble Switch and the vehicle. Okay, so so far at this point, do you believe that every uh, thing that you're gonna document, further document, are in between the crime scene tapes? Yes. Uh, so you've gone to one extreme end of the roadway where the crime scene tape is, and we've already seen that it's taped off at the other end of two intersections. That's correct. Right. Move that as exhibit 53. And what's this photograph? This is just a same direction on San Bernard Road facing east towards the intersection, uh, just a little closer in. Okay. Move that as exhibit 54. All right, Agent Kennard, it looks like we're back to where you began. Yes, sir. And what do you start doing now? So after we've done our initial photographs of the scene, uh, now we've identified pieces of what we've determined to be or possibly be evidence. 
uh, related to the scene, and then we'll, we'll start placing uh, item number markers next to them. Okay. Now we already have introduced a diagram. Are the numbers on the diagram corresponding with these numbered markers that we now see? Yes. So if you were to hold the diagram up to a picture and look for number four, you would see four on the diagram. That's correct. All right. I'll move this as the next exhibit, 55. Uh, Agent Kennard, I believe you've already identified a magazine and a digital scale, and you've labeled these uh, one and two with that, markers. Yes, that's correct. Move that as exhibit 56. All right, here we see marker number three. What, what does that represent? Uh, marker number three is, is denoting the vehicle itself. The actual car. Yes, the car itself. Uh, and, and can you again uh, describe which car, what type of car this is and the license plate number? Uh, yes, it is a, a brownish gray uh, Saturn sedan style vehicle. And the license plate reads BRY013. Okay. And I'll move that as exhibit 57. <clears throat> What's this photograph? This is a photograph of the VIN number or the vehicle identification number that corresponds with that car. So this specifically is up in the windshield, uh, under the windshield on the, on the dash on the front left of the vehicle. And what's the purpose of taking the photograph? To note that that is the car or the VIN number that belongs with that car. And also if the vehicle doesn't have an accurate plate on it, it could have a, a plate from another vehicle taken off and put on it. Um, just another identifier of the vehicle itself. Thank you. I'll move that as exhibit 58. All right, what's this photograph? All right, this is a photograph uh, has a marker number four, and this is the spent cartridge case that's on the roadway um, right next to the front left of the vehicle. I'll move that as exhibit 59. And what's this photograph? Okay, this is a uh, marker number five, and that's denoting the uh, separate spent uh, cartridge case on the roadway, approximately five feet from the vehicle, just on the grass line at the edge of the roadway. I'll move that as exhibit 60. Uh, what's this photograph? This is a, another photograph of the same item, just uh, on its side to identify, so you can, the photograph can identify the specifics of the cartridge case itself. All right, and specifically on this Agent Kennard, can you read the uh, markings on the end of the shell casing? Yes. What does it say? It says Blazer 0.45 Auto. So what is Blazer? Is that the uh, That's the brand, yes. That's the brand, mm -hmm. and what is uh, 0.45 mean? 0.45 is the caliber, so or the size of the projectile, or the size of the bullet. I'll move that as exhibit 61. What does this photograph depict? Uh, this is just a, a photograph back, looking back uh, west on, standing right at the intersection, or almost in the intersection, looking back west on San Bernardino Roadway. Move this as Exhibit 62. All right, Agent Kennard, we see in this photograph what appear to be several numerical marker numbers. Is that correct? Yes. And is this just a general overview of the layout of markers? Yes. All right. So. Yes. Go ahead. I was going to say, so you can see where one is in relation to the other. You know, we will we'll document an overall area and you can see multiple numbers. And then when we get a close up uh, of each one, you'll, you'll know where that is in relation to the other markers. Move that as exhibit 63. All right, agent, in this photograph, we see a marker number six. And what does it document? It is the key card, uh, plastic white key card piece that was on the ground in the middle of San, San Vigner Railway. I'll move that as exhibit 64. Agent Kennard, we have two markers here, seven and eight. What do they represent? Number seven represents the blue button and number eight represents the reddish brown stain on the roadway. Move that as exhibit 65. Uh, Agent Kennard, we see a marker number nine and a partial or Marker number 10, is that correct? That's correct. And what do they represent? Uh, number nine is a, a glove, latex glove that was in the roadway. And number 10 uh, denotes, and yeah, you can see it, more of the reddish brown stain on the roadway. Move that as exhibit 66. Agent Kennard, just to clarify, I think we already did, but yes. uh, when we talk about reddish uh, brown stain or RBS, mm -hmm. uh, yes. 
you can't say it's blood, right? Correct. Why can't you say it's blood? Because I don't know definitively that it's blood. Right, so it hasn't will... been tested yet. Correct. Uh, so you're just reddish brown stain is what it appears to be. That's correct. Okay. Next photograph. <clears throat> okay, this is a, a grouping of uh, items of evidence 10, 11, 12, 13 on San Bernardino Railway. Move that as exhibit 67. And Agent Kennard, here we have marker number 11. What does that represent? That is a close up view of uh, marker number or item 11, which is the reddish brown stain on the roadway. Move that as exhibit 68. And here, Agent Kennard, we have marker number 12. What does it represent? Uh, it also is denoting reddish brown stains, a little smaller and harder to see, but uh, on the roadway. All right. Move that as exhibit 69. <clears throat> Uh -oh. uh, Agent Kennard, I want to make sure we haven't got our photographs out of order. Okay. What, what photograph are you holding in your hand right now, the top photograph? Uh, it is a an overall view of, or a panned out view of items 13, 14, 15, 17, and then what I believe is 26. Okay, and we need to pull that one up on the screen. That's it. All right. Uh, now the photograph you have in your hand is uh, the exact same thing we see on the screen. Is that correct? That's correct. And, and what do we have here? Uh, again, we have a, uh, a wider shot of San Bernardino Roadway, um, items 13, 14, 15, 17. And then what I say, I believe it's 26. It's off in the grass to the right. And Agent Kennard, from this perspective, are we starting to see a, a line or a trail of the RBS? Yes. I'll move that as exhibit 70. What's in this photograph? Uh, this is a item number 13 denoting uh, reddish brown stain on the roadway. Move that as exhibit 71. In Asian Canard here, we have marker number 14. And what does it represent? It's representing, the, there are multiple uh, reddish brown stains on the roadway there um, to the left and below it. We just kind of group that into one. Move that as exhibit 72. And the next photograph. Next photograph is uh, marker number 16. That's a plastic piece uh, that was off to the north side of San Bernardino Roadway, uh, closer to that, that larger pool of reddish brown stain, but it, as you can see in the grass area. Uh, could you tell what this plastic piece originated from? Uh, after looking and seeing all the pieces that were out there, we assumed that it, or we presumed that it came from the sunglasses that were also out there. I'll move this as exhibit 73. Uh, what does this photograph depict? Okay, this is a larger, uh, wider shot uh, looking on down west on San Bernardino Roadway. And then as you can see, it looks like our, uh, item number, or marker number 18 and 20. Move this as exhibit 74. Uh, what do we see here at marker number 18? Okay, it's marker number 18 on the roadway, Sand Vineyard, and that has a, a, a sunglasses lens. Move this as exhibit 75. So, Agent Kennard, this photograph appears to be uh, encompassing <coughs> the roadway. What looks like a tire mark to me, and some grass. Is that correct? That's correct. What What does marker number nineteen represent? Number nineteen is marking the the tire track in the roadway itself. Okay. Move that as exhibit seventy six. And here we have marker number twenty. What does this reflect? Uh, number twenty is a cigarette that was there by the roadway on San Bernardino. Move this as exhibit seventy seven. Agent Kennard, it looks like another overview of the pattern of exhibit markers. Is that right? That's correct. And move that as exhibit 78. What's this one? Uh, this one is an, uh, on the opposite side of the road, uh, which would be, I think, would be the south side of San Vineyard, denoted. And you can see several markers in there 21, 22, 23. I'm a, right side of the roadway next to the what appears to be tire tracks. 
Move that as Exhibit 79. Okay, Agent Kennard, you're now back at the Saturn, is that correct? Yes, sir. And uh, what does this photograph look like? Uh, this photograph is the back rear tire. Move that as Exhibit 80. Passenger and side tire, I apologize. Passenger side tire, yes. rear passenger side rear tire. Rear passenger side tire. And in this marker we have, we see uh, marker number 26. That's correct. Uh, what does this reflect? Uh, there, there was an additional cartridge case found in the grass. Where the marker 26 is? Where the marker 26 is, yes. Move that as exhibit 81. And, and before we go to the next photograph, uh, you've now found cartridge casing, several car cartridge casings, is that correct? Yes, sir. A couple are back near the Saturn. Yes, sir. Outside of the driver's side door. That's correct. This one is, I guess, several feet or yards away near the large pool of blood. That's correct. Next photograph. And what does this identify? And this would be a closer up view of item number 26, which is this, the uh, spent cartridge case. It's kind of harder to see because it, it had been pressed down into the, into the grass and mud. All right. I'll move that as exhibit 82. Okay. Agent Kennard, what do we have here? Uh, this is a marker number 27 also, which is off in the side of the, uh, in the grass off the side of the roadway. And what does it represent? A, a spent cartridge case that was found as well. All right, move that as exhibit 83. And is this a close up of the spent cartridge casing? It is. Found at exhibit or with marker number 27? That's correct. Move this as exhibit 84. All right, <clears throat> I think that was our last photo. That was the last one I have. So, Agent Kennard, how were you able to find the shell casings in the grass. Did you see those with your own eyes or? We had to use a metal detector. Okay, so you had folks out there with a metal detector yes. uh, searching on both sides of the road? That's correct. Did it appear that all the shell casings were on one side of the road? Yes. Right. If I could have just one moment. Now. Madam Clerk, if I could see exhibit number five, please. It's a plastic bag. Uh, yes, it looks like a bag that contains one, two, three, four um, unfired pistol rounds. All right, and Agent Kennard, that's been previously marked as exhibit number five in this trial. Okay. Uh, without opening the bag or breaking the seal, can you look closely at the uh, ammunition and see what brand and caliber those are? Sure. Okay. Uh, all four of them read Blazer 0.45 Auto or 45 Auto. And that's the same brand as the casings you found at the San Vineyard Tiddle Switch crime scene? That's correct. All right. If you could hand Exhibit 5 back to the clerk. And just to kind of wrap it up, you, other than documenting with photographs and, and uh, marker numbers, mm -hmm. did you take swabs of items at the crime scene? We did. We did. Where there was the reddish brown stain on the ground, we swab those. And what does that mean to swab it? Uh, we take a sample of it. Um, what do you do with those? Uh, we will seal them up after we take a sample of it, um, seal it up, and then we will submit it to our lab to, for testing. And that's reflected also in your diagram? Yes. Okay. I'll pass the witness. Finley, ladies and gentlemen, is everybody okay? Well, it's evening now. Good evening. Good evening. So <clears throat> you were the first TBI agent on scene. Now, I would refer to this as the initial shooting scene. Did you ever go to the second scene? I did not. Okay. So you never saw Sergeant Baker's patrol? That's correct. All right. Now, you also, at one point during this, during your investigation, you sent off a lab request have some microfiber examination done. Is that correct? Uh, I believe so. If I can pass you this document. Sure. 
<laughs> Thank you. Uh, Agent, I highlighted. What is this your handwriting? It is. Okay. So read that, if you would, please. It says number two, and then it says microfiber to place miles in deputy's vehicle. Now, it's kind of a funny way to request something, isn't it? Well, it's just it's what I wrote. Okay, but you're kind of asking, it seems like, or it could sound like, that you're telling them what you want them to find. Uh, it's more of why I'm, it's more of an explanation as to why I'm submitting it. Okay. So you it could be, could be, I understand what you're saying, but that's, uh, you know, my, when we submit things, they will, we will often put on their, you know, why we're doing it. Um, and in this case, obviously, you know, we have the, the items that are being submitted, which are items that belonged uh, to Ms. Castro Miles. And so, you know, that was, you know, the reason why they would do microanalysis is, you know, that's what, Okay. That's what we're looking for. So it wasn't necessarily a suggestion other than just, you know, whether the positive the results were positive or negative. That's what to see if they were in there. And you did this on, I guess, May 31st? Yes. Okay. The next day. Yes. Can I make this the next exhibit, please? This is the request for an analysis. Yes, Your Honor. You also applied for a search warrant to search the Saturn in question, the one you took several photographs of. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And every time any law enforcement official applies for a search warrant, you have to send in a sworn affidavit. Yes. And do you remember signing the affidavit when you did the search warrant on this? Uh, I do. Okay. And do you remember saying, Wiggins then told Castro Miles to run and hide. Castro Miles took off running toward Pumpkin Branch Road. She ran through the wooded area to the south of the sh shooting scene. Castro Miles kept moving south into Hickman County, Tennessee. Uh, do I remember that that's in there? Right. Uh, I, I'll, I will take your word for it. Well, I'll without let you, having it. You can have it. Okay. I may approach your honor. Right. Paragraph 15. Yes, sir. Okay. And when you do these affidavits, you're swearing under oath that everything in there is true to the best of your knowledge, right? Uh, yes. It, this particular, the probable cause in this affidavit was not, I did not write this myself. So. But you're swearing it's true. I mean, you're submitting this affidavit to a judicial official to get us to get a, a search warrant. That's correct. It came from fellow law enforcement that are related to the investigation. So I have no reason to believe that it's not. Okay. Fair and accurate, true and accurate. And it's under oath? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> and you're saying, hey, judge or judicial magistrate, whoever you're applying to, this is all the facts to the best of my knowledge. That's correct. Okay. Um, I'd like to make that the next exhibit. Okay, judge. This is exhibit 86. <clears throat> so I guess what I'm asking now is what date? If we could have that back real quick, Madam Clerk, what date was that executed? Sorry. It was executed on the same day, June 1st. June 1st, so the following day after you did the lab request? Uh, yes. Okay. And obviously you didn't have lab results back that fast. Correct. I mean, I know they work fast when you want them to, but. Well, I, not to my knowledge, I, they didn't have them back to my knowledge. Okay. So, okay, we can, we can make that in there. And, uh, so it, it sounds like you're asking the lab to look for evidence that she's in a patrol car on one day, and then the next day you're swearing under oath that she was never in the car. Uh, the information in the search warrant, again, <clears throat> was not information that I wrote in that probable cause. If that's information that was developed between those two times, and I'm swearing to it, I don't have any. If it came from you know, fellow law enforcement, I don't have any reason to believe that it's not true. So you're not fact checking the information before you're submitting it, or you're not talking about these and making sure what you're saying is accurate. To the, uh, did when you it, read it before you signed it? I did. When it comes to me, um, I have no reason to believe that the the information in there is not true and accurate. I don't. We don't have. It's not commonplace or the time or the ability to go fact check everything in there before we do that. I mean, that's, you know, if it came from law enforcement, 
associated with this investigation. Again, I have no reason to believe that it's not true and accurate. But this is the process that we that, that law enforcement uses to go search people's homes, right? The search warrant process, yes, sir. Right, and, and search people's vehicles. Obviously, that's what was happening here. You can yes, search sir. somebody's cell phone, and get yes, bank sir. records and all that stuff. Yes, sir. But you just, you're not sure if everything when you sign these search warrants, you're not sure of the facts in them? I have no reason to believe that the facts in them are not true. One second. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Agent Knorr, in your career at the TBI, how many search warrants have you signed? Uh, many. So when you're applying for a search warrant, does that mean that you're looking for evidence? Yes. And you're using probable cause, meaning the theory of the case uh, and the facts that you've gathered to present to a judge to get and search for additional evidence. Yes. To determine what happened at a crime. Yes. That's Correct me if I'm wrong, but that's actually the purpose of a search warrant is to gather evidence. That's correct. To solve a crime. Yes. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, officer. You may step down, Agent. Thank you. thank you. Mr. Crouch, was that all of the witnesses you had for today? All more of it. We might have a rebellion in our hands. <laughs> um, we will therefore end our session today and uh, resume at nine o'clock tomorrow morning. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're gonna transport you back to your uh, lodging and then we will bring you back in the morning and start fresh again at nine o'clock. I would remind you of my instructions about not trying to do any research, not letting anyone talk to you about this case, but most importantly, don't try to, I know you'll be housed together you know, in separate rooms, but if you will make sure you don't try to discuss this case or the evidence that you've heard thus far until uh, after all of the evidence is concluded. All right. And that concludes our business for today and we will adjourn for the day. All rise. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if they're going to call. Yeah. How many more you got? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like um, for real. So, tomorrow we start out. Yeah. 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 Billy filed a petition.